The day before Thanksgiving in 1971, a man identifying himself as Dan Cooper bought a plane ticket from Portland to Seattle. He hijacked the plane, claiming he had a bomb in his briefcase and demanded $200,000 in four parachutes. He jumped out of the plane with the money and the bomb somewhere over the Pacific Northwest, never to be seen again. The FBI claims to have investigated over a thousand people, including dozens of deathbed confessions. In 2016, 45 years after the hijacking, the FBI suspended its investigation of the case. While the FBI is no longer looking for D.B. Cooper, there is a community of people who are trying to solve the case on their own. Welcome to the Cooper Vortex. In this episode, we're lucky to be joined by a brilliant CPA living in the Mississippi Delta. While he may spend his days balancing aquaculture books, he spends his nights deep in the vortex. A humble and generous family man, but unfortunately a Lakers fan. He's a great researcher and expert on the D.B. Cooper case. He also specifically told me not to say that he was an expert. Once you listen to what he has to say, I'm sure you'll side with me. Enjoy this episode with my good friend, Drew Daniel. All right, Drew, let's start with how old are you? I am 34 years old, Darren. So you don't remember the skyjacking in 1971 (laughs) at all? No, I don't. You know, I don't feel like I do. If I did, there would be something wrong, I believe. When was the first time you heard about D.B. Cooper? You know, it's, uh, I, when, I, th- I think, it, when did you start the podcast? Uh, 2018, is that right? Somewhere around 2018, there? yep. Okay, yeah. So I was, um, my daughter always has this habit of, like, um, when I come home from work, she wants, like, interesting factoid. So I would always, every day, towards the end of the work, I would pull up the Wikipedia page, and they had those five little blurps of, did you know, did you know? And uh, I guess it had to have been close to the anniversary and uh, did you know D.B. Cooper hijacked an airplane in 1971 was on there. And that I clicked on that was my first ever exposure to D.B. Cooper. And uh, I read through the uh, the Wikipedia at the time. I, I, it was like three or four suspects listed on there. It was they had Kenny Christensen listed and Barb Dayton and uh, uh, McCoy and maybe uh, Rackstraw as well. But I, I read through that and I thought, wow, this is crazy. It, it, it seems like for sure it must be McCoy, which is a crazy thing to say now. But uh, I thought I got to learn more about this, and I I've always been a big podcast listener, so I, I pulled up uh you know I searched DB Cooper and Apple Podcasts, and yours was the first one that came up. I think you had maybe five or six episodes out at that time, and uh, just got right in on it. Like it used to, well, you mentioned off air with Bruce Smith was the first one, so felt a little overwhelmed at first, but I found it more and more interesting as I kept continue to listen. What was that like to go from reading? Which at that point in time, the Wikipedia page was much more sparse than it is today. Right, yeah. So what was it like to go from reading the Wikipedia page to hearing me and Bruce Smith talk about the wildest stuff inside the Vortex and going right into obscure names and right into this person said this and this has been going on in the drop zone for five years? Yeah, yeah. So it was intense. I was driving home and uh it was you know i was listening to it as i was driving and names kept popping up i kept trying to google on my phone and finally i just said all right i need to stop and listen to this in the morning when i'm sitting at my computer and i can uh see what they're talking about as i go uh and you know I, bruce I, he seems i mean i know everybody respects him to death and he's very i mean obviously he's added a lot to the case but especially in that first episode he seemed unhinged so it's like you know i had to uh i don't know it, it definitely was intense you have the right thought there but, uh, you know, your next couple episodes, especially those earlier episodes, they were all, uh, you were kind of going to the the suspect peddlers, if you want to call them that. And that was the part I found the most interesting, you know, when I first started look, listening, you know, learning about D.B. Cooper. So once you just start listening to the podcast, how quickly do you, would you say you fell into the vortex? That's a good question. I, You know, I didn't, What that's part of what I loved about the podcast was that it seems like the best podcast guests for this one are either people that are very, very expert and lifelong, you know, dedicated to it than have an encyclopedic knowledge or are completely crazy. <laughs> and uh, those are the ones that I enjoyed the most. And I, what I liked about it was I thought, look at what this thing, this it's uh, took place one night 50 years ago and look what it has done to these people. And I kind of feel like the, the podcast part of it, maybe unintentionally, but it's kind of like shows a, the lens of uh, what an obsession like this can do to you. And I, you know, like I said, I was always laughing at those people and then, uh, get deeper and deeper into it. You know, I think maybe, um, 
not long after that had to have been when Eric aired the uh, History Channel documentary and then launched the Facebook group not long after that. And, uh, you know, I got deep, deep into that, obviously. And I was talking to my wife one time. Uh, I'm sure that you have the same experience. You know, you talk to your relatives and your friends about D.B. Cooper and tell them about, you know, uh, intricacies about the, the case, like, oh, there's titanium alloy that uh, has some uh, antimony on it and it might be indicative that it is only in this one small place and their eyes just glaze over. And uh, I was sharing with her some findings about that one day and she said, so do you think they're ever going to find this guy? And it, I knew the answer in my head at the time was no. <laughs> you know, that's what I thought. So, and then, I, but then, and then it made me think, all right, what am I even doing with this thing? Why am I doing this? And that's when I realized I was in the vortex. <laughs> so it, it was probably a couple of years later, but not long, not long after. You know, so many people, probably including myself, when you start looking at it from the outside, you're like, look at all these clowns obsessing about D.B. Cooper all the time. Mm -hmm. And then slowly you're more and more involved. And then all of a sudden you're posting and no, now you're defending your point, And now you're telling this person they're wrong. And I completely disagree with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I try to avoid that wrinkle of it as much as I can, but you get sucked in every, just like the vortex of it down then. Do you think the vortex is a contentious place or do you think it's welcoming? You know, that's another good question. And it kind of goes back to my personal uh, journey, I guess, into the vortex. I listened to your podcast for a while, you know, got deep into that, and then you guys kept mentioning drop zone, drop zone, drop zone. So I thought, oh my gosh, and this was before the Facebook group was out, and I thought, I need to go check that out, I need to read what they're saying. Log in, and it's like nothing but two to three people uh, name-calling and uh, dismissing points and discrediting points, and almost, it felt at the time, I scrolled through six, seven, eight pages, that it was there was no new content, it was just people uh, that hated each other, basically. So that's one thing I loved about the Facebook group to start. Uh, you know, it wasn't like that. Everybody was very receptive and uh, open to, they. you know, if somebody brand new could come in and say, hey, I'm new to the case, they could say something boneheaded like, you know, the, he hit on the plane and people would still comment and say, hey, welcome to the group. Uh, DM me if you'd like. Or, you know, they were nice. Uh, but now the Facebook group sort of turned the same way where if you <laughs> issue your opinion, uh, somebody's going to be offended. I'll say that. Uh, so, yes, I think, unfortunately, the Vortex is inherently a contentious place. Did you ever at any point think that you could solve the case? Definitely not. I don't think so. Uh, you know, this this thing that what's so what sucks you in, I think, is you uh, once you start learning about it, it just everybody says this line just feels like it's one piece away. You know, it, it's kind of like um, it's old enough that it kind of feels like a, a, a folk story, like a legend, but it's new enough that there's documentation related to it. And I think that those that uh, uh, pairing is kind of what pulls me into it. I, so when I first got into it, I thought, absolutely no way to solve the case. And then whenever the um, Thai particles came out, you know, when the revelation about the titanium antimony was first came out, I thought, okay, this is, they got this thing tightened up. But of course, now we know there's some caveats to that. So I don't know. I don't think I ever thought I would solve the case. I was hoping I could be watching somebody do it or talking to them as they do it. I'll say that. That's kind of my attitude. I've just been waiting here for someone to finally solve this case. Yeah. And then hopefully they reach out to me like, hey, uh, Darren, I solved this case. Uh, can yeah, I come yeah, on right. Show? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, I always uh, think in my head, Ryan Burns, you know, everybody's got to shout out Ryan Burns now. He's the like, you know, everybody's best bud, I guess. I always think Ryan might not solve the case, but he's definitely going to be talking to the guy that does because. He's like the you know command central for information. If anybody comes up with something new, they're going to bounce off around first. Oh, and it, it, he's going so deep. I watched uh, a big portion of his interview with Bruce yesterday, and he was like, hey, did you ever talk to Jim blah, blah, blah of this drop zone? And it's, mm -hmm. Brian was like, I talked to him on the phone. It's like, yeah, yeah. What? You saw one name in one FBI file or something, and Ryan tracked him down and talked to him on the phone. And yeah, absolutely. There's so much crazy energy there. Yeah, he's he's he, and he has he'll he's like a dog with a bone. He'll just get after it until he fi figures it out. And not only that, but he has like an encyclopedic knowledge of the case. So, you know, like if I learn a new bit of information, I may not remember, uh, you know, what color Flo's hair was or whatever that may pertain to that. But Ryan's gonna know down to the detail. So every I think everything new that comes to him, he he can uh he can look back on the entire history of the case and see how it applies to that. Unlike most of us. Oh, and an incredible ability for recall. 
Yeah. John Limbaugh also talking to him. I was just blown away by his ability to just pull out names and dates. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from absolutely. so many different things. I'm definitely jealous of that. I'm like sh- struggling to recall any name or I'm hesitant to say dates or ages of people because I'm like, oh, someone's going to reach out and say he wasn't 28. He was 26 at the time. Yeah, like, I know. Okay. That's just, I'm kind of like that with Cooper, especially it's it's a bad habit. But, it, it, you know, I'm always I'm constantly adding, deleting files in my brain. And if it's particularly with something I don't view as important at the time, I, I don't feel like I retain it very well. But these ghost guys you mentioned are all like that. They they remember it and hold on to it. Oh, yeah. And I think one of my big problems is I have to, I don't have to, I choose to uh, read some pretty obscure books or books that wouldn't necessarily be popular with some of the more serious characters in the Vortex. And that really clouds the whole Cooper case for me because I've read all these accounts where they might stretch the truth here or there on some facts mm-hmm. or even straight up make up some things to fit a narrative and so i've read so many different accounts that it's it's tough to keep facts straight between suspects or even between what what actually happened and what i read in some book that wasn't true yeah absolutely yeah and you're right there seems like there's some bad actors along the way like uh whether it was intentional or not that spread misinformation i think like we were just there was just a discussion in the facebook group about whether or not he had stained fingers uh you know from the tobacco and it turns out it was just Himmelsbach, I don't know if he fabricated it or you know misremembered something else, and but apparently that's where it came from. Yeah, and I mean he obviously he was a smoker, so oh, yeah, th- there is some sort of level of tobacco stain. But you have to think about like what would have been common at the time. Yeah, 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 so yeah. If you're smoking a pack and a half a day, and I'm not a smoker, and ten years later we look at each other's hands, your fingers are going to look a little different than mine. I mean, I, I've, I've, my grandmother was a smoke for 50 plus years. I don't, I've seen her hands up close plenty of times. I don't think I've ever noticed any stains. I mean, are you a smoker yourself? No, no, not at all. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I was for a short period of my life. And I mean, it was, I did, that's, I never experienced any of that, but it wasn't, I didn't smoke for that long either. So I couldn't tell you, but I will say, I do, I, I assume this was going to come up. I thought maybe you'd ask me directly, but I think it's safe to say for sure that uh, Cooper was a smoker for sure. I mean, you know, some people suggest that he did he smoked as a ruse, but he smoked uh seven cigarettes. I mean, if you I don't yeah, I know you said you were not a smoker. Have you smoked before? I've probably smoked maybe five cigarettes total in my life. I've smoked okay. maybe two dozen cigars. Now the first time that you, that you smoked a cigarette, did you would you ever dream of immediately lighting another one up with that head change and everything you had going? No, no, definitely That's what I'm not. Saying. It's not. Uh, he wouldn't go for seven, and seven is completely unnecessary. I mean, honestly, one would probably represent the the that he was faking smoking, much less seven. Uh, and then not only that, another piece uh, that suggests he was a smoker is he gives he, Tina's lighting his matches. Uh, I mean, lighting his uh, cigarettes with the matches. A detail I absolutely love. Yes, it's very suave, isn't it? Which is weird for his personality, but we'll get into that later. I think the uh, he. But he gives her a, a matchbook that is partially spent, or even perhaps mostly spent. And then whenever 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 he runs out, when that matchbook is empty, he produces another one. So I mean, that's deep galaxy brain type stuff. If he said, "I'm going to fake smoking, and I'm going to throw away some matches," that way it looks like I have a history of smoking. Because I don't think that uh, anybody would ever think that she would even consider that necessary to prove that he was a smoker. Yeah. Like you said, one cigarette or even two, I could see that as being a disguise. But he did. He smoked seven cigarettes. Right, yeah. recently I was corrected on because I've always been saying eight. But Mm -hmm. eight was the number of cigarettes collected. One of the cigarettes collected was his cigarette he gave to Tina to smoke. Right, yes, exactly. And that's, you know, before I want to talk about the tie and as it pertains to smoking. But before we do that, uh, one thing I've always been confused about is, you know, Tina says that she didn't get a good look at his face, which I, I understand. You know, I would think that she's, um, you know, looking down, kind of timid. I mean, even me talking to a, a stranger, I don't like to look him in the eye. But you would think, I've never understood if she's lighting these cigarettes. I mean, I feel like she must be just staring directly into his face. Have you ever thought, felt that weird? Yeah, that comment I'm really not sure about. I it, it could just be her out of frustration being done dealing with the FBI because... I mean, when she said she didn't get a good look at him, that was months later, right? Or even 
a year or two later, something like that. Because her story changes. Yes, absolutely, yeah. But you, time you could time. be right. And she got so bombarded with, look at this picture, look at this picture, look at the this lineup. You know, I, I th- that is a good point. That could definitely be it. Yeah, because Bill Mitchell said that they showed up with like a stack of several different yearbooks and company uh, employee logs and things. And like, hey, look at this and look at this and see if any of these pictures look familiar, which that's so crazy. Mm-hmm. That's not a suspect lineup. That's here. Look at 800 pictures of dudes yeah. and see if any look familiar. Yeah. And the craziest thing about that, I've always thought uh, that I didn't, cannot believe this is out in front and center in everybody's minds. I was surprised when were, uh, Ron told me about it years ago that. That one of the pictures they showed him was from a uh, hoaxer. It was in a magazine. The guy pretended to be D.B. Cooper, and he uh, sent pictures. And they showed that picture to the the eyewitnesses, and they all said that looks just like like him. And when I heard that, I thought, why is this guy not the you know template for what he looks like? And then of course they said when he took off his glasses or from a different angle, they said, oh, it doesn't look anything like him. But there's some key features I think in that uh, picture that are you know. The fact that they thought it looked just like him, and they and these same features show up in their testimony. Particularly, he had the the you know the pouty lip. Like I remember when I first got into DB Cooper, that had never been referenced before, or at least I didn't notice it. And everybody now they look for the uh you know like a fat lip. But if you look at that the picture of the and, and that's kind of what it seems like from the witness testimony to me. But if you look at the um that hoaxer image, he has kind of like uh this is the technical term for it, but in my brain I called old guy lip, where it's like. You know, it's it's jutting, not necessarily fat or puffy. It's kind of almost like an underbite is what it looks like. So that that's one thing I've taken. You know, when I learned about that and then compared it to the wit- eyewitness testimonies, any guy that I'm looking at to potentially have a likeness, that's a feature I'm looking for, for sure. I agree with you because there's only two sort of interesting features like that that's called out for Cooper. Mm-hmm. Three if you count all of skin, I guess, but I don't really yeah. count that. But he had a pouty lip, a pouty lower lip, or a lower lip that kind of jetted out a little bit, and a bit of a turkey neck or some loose skin on his neck. Right. Those are the only things that you wouldn't say about this stereotypical average guy. Exactly, yeah. And that's another thing, too. I'll say, you know, a lot of people seem to be quick to discount the swarthy uh, swarthy, uh, comment, but... I mean, it's consistent across almost all of them. I think it was Bill Mitchell, the only one that didn't. He said he looked like a white guy. I think it was this a geeky old white guy, right? The, all, all the rest of them said swarthy or. And then the one, <laughs> this brings me to another thing. One testimony I always thought was crazy is uh, uh, Robert Gregory. Is that the one? Robert Gregory uh, is the one. Yes, Robert Gregory. He says um, he looks back at the hijacker because he thinks it's odd that the steward is sitting with him, like all the men said. And Tina tells him, don't look at him. And to me, but then he makes sure that he gets another look. And to me, that's, you know, if somebody said, don't look at him, but I make sure I look again, that's, you know, the um, alarm bells should be off in his mind that I need to retain this information or something's odd about that person. You know what I mean? And he's one of the ones that said Mexican, possibly Native American descent. So I don't know that that's kind of always stuck with me to kind of in my my own opinion, personal opinion uh, that. Swarthy was definitely an aspect to it. Now, he, some of the other parts of his his testimony are all over the place. Like, I think he's pegged him as 35 years old and maybe with greasy hair, I think he said. Something to that effect, which I don't think anybody else did. So, I don't know. You take it as you will. But the fact that he said uh, Mexican, possibly Native American, I don't know. That kind of drills it in for me. It's such a great example of eyewitness testimony when none of these people knew they had to pay attention to him. There was no reason except for Tina to take note of this guy. Yeah. And we get such varying wild descriptions. To an extent, yes. Yeah. They're they're off a little to an extent, certainly. But the general consensus was, you know, you know, the, you know, at 40, 40 or late 30s to 50, uh, you know, medium to well built. I think this is the terminology they use. Five eight, five ten to six feet tall. You know, we do, we they, they do stay within a certain parameter. But you're right; there are some u- unique ones to each uh, testimony. With that, even on the wanted poster, it says like possibly. I think I have the wanted poster on here somewhere, but it's like possibly Hispanic or Native American ancestry. Right. Yeah. From comes from Gregory. Like I said, there might have been more people that said it, but I know he did. And and how many suspects have Hispanic or Native American ancestry? That's what I'm saying. As I became more obsessed with this case those things made me go what like 
the more you, the deeper you get into this thing, you realize nobody is a good fit. The people that they're talking about are not a good fit in any capacity. It seems like, and it, it, for the longest time, it seemed like either it needed to be, you know, have some other sensational crime, or so you had to have confessed to be DB Cooper. That's pretty much the only people that were being considered. What do you think? Let's, let's talk about confessions. Mm. Why have so many people confessed to this crime, Drew? Man, you know, I should have, I knew that I should have prepared for this one. I didn't even think about this question, but I know, uh, you know, it's, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's a cool legacy to leave. And it's, I mean, it's not a victimless crime, but it's pretty much as close as you can. It's pretty much the closest victimless crime you can get to le reach, you know, legendary folklore status. I don't know. I could see how somebody that, like people have mentioned in the past, he's kind of a loser and didn't have a good life. Nothing really that, you know, sensational about him. And he just wants to make himself feel, you know, look cooler to his uh, um, loved ones, I guess. Right. And why not choose Cooper over uh, the Atlanta child killer? Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You can't. There's not many crimes that you can confess to to look cool and, and remain, you know, uh, keep your dignity. Do you think Cooper confessed to this crime to anyone? Uh, you know what? I don't know. Unless he was, I think in that era, it was uh, just about impossible not to tell your wife, especially if he's spending the money, which I mean, we'll get into that later too, I'm sure. But I don't think he, yeah, we know that he didn't spend the money, I guess, or it's very unlikely anyway. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I tend to say if he was married with children, probably did. Yes. But uh, that's kind of a coin flip. It's sort of subjective, which is why everybody loves this case. Everything's subjective. So do you think it's possible that one of the suspects that have confessed is Cooper? No, no, I do not. I do not think so. Okay, so you think it's possibly a, there's a group of people out there that knows the truth that have yeah, come forward? Certainly, yeah, it's definitely possible for sure. Not likely probably, but certainly possible. Well, when are they going to come forward? He's dead I don't know. now. It depends on how much they like the guy, maybe never. Or what his what his uh, conditions were, you know. I mean, you know, he probably, well, as he told me, Obviously, told him not to tell anyone. But he's dead now. Well, it's their it's their father, grandfather, husband. Do you think that it, if if uh, someone out there is holding the truth to the story, that there is a value, a financial value to the true story? Absolutely, I think that one hundred percent. I th it's crazy to me when people say, "I don't care who figures it out. I just want it to be solved." Because if somehow I stumbled or fumbled or bumbled into figuring it out, I would not tell anyone. The first thing I'll do is call Netflix, HBO, uh, you know, Paramount Plus, whoever, to uh, try to get a producer on the hook and, you know, sell them something that is verifiable and for sure. And I think there's a lot of money to be made for something like that. Okay, I'm very angry and very hurt that you didn't mention calling me in that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, you can get looped into. You can get a producer credit on it. <laughs> right. Oh, oh, yeah. After you got your big deal. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to make sure we put you on camera and make you say a bunch of shit you didn't want to say the first. How dare you? <laughs> okay, I'm not working with you on the documentary in the future. All right, Drew. Do you think the flight path is accurate? Definitely. Yes. That is something. You know, it's. I don't really know why anybody chooses to even question at this point. I mean. You know, I, my my knowledge of the flight path stems largely from Chris Cunningham. Uh, his uh, discussions and uh, with he t he talked to someone I can't remember the guy's name, but he was a um he was like a lifelong um uh, employee. Uh, I think he, he might have been in the Canadian military that um tra used Sage to track things, and uh you know that system Sage it, 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 they they relied on it to uh for national security. I mean, it's there's a lot of um i don't know you're saying a lot if you say something that we trust to protect uh you know the general population isn't reliable that's kind of crazy and i think that the only way that i mean you know i'll just come around and say i think eric is real eric ulis is probably really the only guy that is really championing the the flight path to be incorrect now at least the guys that are you know out in front and um you know his theory is that the uh i'm sorry eric if i'm misquoting you but i feel like this is your uh sentiment is that the in the flight path, it, the sage was was pinging, but the sage uh, tracking was on the chase planes that that followed uh, three hundred five. You know, they of course they scrambled chase planes to follow it. Now, so the only I think the only way possible that it's wrong is if, like Eric said, they're they're mapping the chase planes. Now, the problem with that is the chase planes. You know, as you know, they they their speed was 
their stall speed was much faster than 305. So they're doing S turns though, along the whole path. And I think Eric points to that little jut, uh, you know, on the flight path, you know, soon before the jump. And he says, look, that's the, the plane coming in and making an S turn. But that if you look at Victor 23, that kind of turn is sort of just inherently in Victor 23. And then the problem is the chase planes followed him all the way down to Reno and there's no S turns the rest of the way. I mean, it doesn't, there's not a lot there. I don't think that there's any reason to question the flight path at this point in time. Also, is a 727 bigger than the chase planes? I, I, yes, I felt confident. And not only that, but that guy that Chris talked to, I'm going to butcher this fact, but the chase plane, I mean, the uh, uh, 727, when it started squawking that it was in distress, that activated the uh, Sage to track it. And it gives it, a, I don't know if there's a transponder on the plane itself or if it's just Sage tags it and tracks it there forward, but there's a unique identifier in the data that says this is, you know, uh, flight 305, basically. And the same thing with the chase plane. So the guy building the data, according to uh, what I understand from the gentleman Chris Cunningham talked to, the data that the guy would have used to make the map, he would have unique identifiers on each ping that would make it essentially impossible for him to confuse the chase planes and uh, flight 305 for one another when crafting that, that flight path. Which is an absolute critical feature of that because we need to identify our own aircraft from the enemies. Exactly. Yes. That's yeah. Exactly. I mean, I, I don't think I think that's far fetched at this point to to trust anything other than the. Uh, I mean, sure, that's it could be you know a mile or two here off of the center line of Victor twenty three, but I think for the most part it was spot on Victor twenty three the whole way through. I I absolutely agree with you. I, I yeah. think there's some deviation from the center line, absolutely, but not something mm. wildly off and if if we got some magical document right now that showed us the exact position of the plane at every minute at every second how much closer does that get us to solving the case well you know it depends on what your opinion is on the jump i think uh you know obviously this i think these two questions always go hand in hand but the flight path the i don't want to say i don't think eric's construing the facts any way to fit his narrative or anything like that i'm not trying to say that but i think that um one reason he really uh well let me take that back i don't think that he's trying to present facts in a narrative that just fit what he wants them to say but i think one reason why he doesn't trust the flight path let me say that is because he believes that um cooper landed at or near tina bar right um and i think that's the main reason why he doesn't think it could be right you know among all of his other points i'm not trying to discredit him anyway and I think that, uh, you know, if you're like, you know, if you're of that opinion that there's something wacky with Tina Barr, or if you are of the opinion that he died upon impact, and I would say that knowing where the flight path is, is very critical to even the current investigation. And now the course that correlates with the jump, you know, jump time, which is a whole nother topic. Yeah. You know, and Dr. Edwards book, did you read that? Absolutely. Yes. I would recommend to anybody listening. That's the, the resources that I've read. I know, I don't have, this is, uh, it's wild to me that it gets poo-pooed so much, but. Well, cause you're a math guy. Well, you know, that's uh, that's I just told Chris this the other day. There's some weird false narrative out in the ether that CPAs are good at math, and I'm <laughs> going to do whatever I can to keep that lie alive. So, yeah, sure, I'm a math guy. It's very it's <laughs> beneficial to us. And then uh, the other thing, too, everybody says that it's so dense and so mathematic. I was I was looking back on I flipped back through it today. I thought, is there that much math in this book? I didn't really get that. I didn't pick that up as I read through it. Well, there isn't much math for you to do as the reader, but he is doing a lot of math, figuring out where his drop zones are. Absolutely, yeah. So he's sort of, he has to present like, this is the information I use to come up with this. Yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, you know, I didn't, when I read that book, I was not that, I didn't understand the uh, jump time being off so bad. You know, there there's that, um, I don't know if anybody's talked about this on the podcast or not, but there's that whole bit about how, um, you know, when the FBI made their drop zone, it was uh they they looked at the transcript and they saw the line that said we're getting oscillations in the cabin, and of course now we know that they would they actually said we're getting oscillations in the cabin rate of climb indicator, and the drop happened after that. And I when I was looking back through it today, you know I learned that just within the past year from I think Chris told me or Ryan, and uh I was looking back through Doctor Edwards' book and I was really surprised he actually does did say that explicitly in his book as well. But uh, you know his drop zone didn't seem right either, didn't he? Did he have them jumping past the Columbia River or maybe just at the Columbia River? Yeah, he has I think he has two sort of drop zones in that book and one is mm. sort of just north of the Columbia and one is potentially just south. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's most likely at this. You know, they they have the um, they got back in touch touch with them. I think it's at eight nineteen. It says, it says we called you. So we know that he must have jumped before eight nineteen. So it was any time between those two time marks. I think any basically any time from eight thirteen to eight nineteen, but likely somewhere you know in the median. Do you think Cooper had an idea of where he was jumping or had an idea of where he wanted to jump? I, I, I do. I th this is uh, my opinion, so nobody, nobody get your panties in the water or whatever, but I do feel like that is the case. So let me pull my notes up here really quick. That's one thing I, I think I'd like to get across in this podcast more than anything is that I think Cooper really, this was well planned, very well planned. Okay, yes. he. So yeah, he gets the stairs down. Oh, no, no. Okay, I'm sorry. He tells Tina to go up to the cabin at 7.40, okay? He gets the stairs down at 7.42, but then he he does not jump until 8.15. Now, remember, when he, when he sends Tina up, he's already cannibalized the uh, reserve chute and wrapped, you know, the I think the 302 Tina's description says he wrapped it this way horizontally and then wrapped it this way vertically, almost like he's cocooning the bag. And he's got it, then he ties it around his waist. So before he even sends it up, uh, unless he did something that we don't know to prepare for the jump, he should have been ready to jump. But he basically waits, you know, from the time he sends her up, he waits 35 minutes, I believe it is. Yeah, 35 minutes. And then the other thing, too, with that is that he he asked them, you know, send me to Mexico. All right. Now, I think that's that's important for two things. He says, he says uh, Mexico, and they said, we can't get there while the plane's dirty. Well, if if you look at the uh, the configuration, sorry, that is, if you look at the maximum range for a seven twenty seven, it's almost spot on. That's that's the pretty much exactly how far it could go is to Mexico City. He just didn't account for the uh, drag and whatnot from the flaps being down, the stairs being down. So that's I think interesting. He, I didn't know that. So Mexico yes, City would have been. It's right at the peak range, which I think, in my mind, is indicative of somebody that either just had inherent knowledge of a seven twenty seven or spent time to research what its capabilities are range wise. And then another to, to piggyback on that, he knew exactly uh how long and, and what the process was to refuel the seven twenty seven. And when they brought the second fuel truck, he basically called them out that they were, you know, uh doing something they're not supposed to. So I, you know, I know a lot of people lately have been saying not lately necessarily, it's always been the case, but a lot of people don't think it was well planned at all. But those are two points amongst a couple other I'm gonna make that I think were really um indicative of him planning it for maybe not for a long time but for a while that is really interesting drew i i hadn't heard that before that mexico city would have been at the end or extended end of the range of that aircraft if yeah. it was flying in a normal configuration right which yeah. also if you're planning to jump out you would want that plane to just keep flying as long as it can you wouldn't want to say i'm going to jump out north of portland you guys go ahead and land in salem absolutely yes exactly he wanted the max he quoted the maximum range that tells you that he wanted to fly in the air as long as possible. That's really interesting. I like that. Yeah. All right. So now he, um, going back to our other point, uh, I can't remember what the exact question is, but we're talking about his, did he, okay, did he intentionally, um, did he know where he jumped? So he tells him, take me to Mexico. He's got a direction he wants the plane to fly. They say, we can't make it to Mexico City. Uh, well, can we take you to San Francisco? He says, no. They say, uh, I can't remember what his rebuttal is, and then they give him another city, I believe Sacramento. He says no. And then when they choose Reno, he says that's okay. So the the fact that he... Wasn't his rebuttal Yuma? I think Yuma may have been where he said they could refuel or something. I can't... That You may be right about that. I'm, my memory's hazy on that. That's one of those add and delete files moments. I think it's Yuma because Yuma sticks out because it's such a weird place to, to suggest. Yeah. that We need to see if that would hit you on Victor 23. That's what I'm getting at. I think that he may not he he could or could not have known that what Victor what Victor twenty three was, but I think he definitely uh was waiting for them to select somewhere that would fly the direction he wanted to go. I, I agree with you. I think he gave them enough information that they would have to put themselves on that road. Right. Exactly, yes. Which again is very indicative of somebody that had a plan, a well crafted plan. Like I was good, the point I was getting to before, he he has a thirty to thirty five minute window in which he's ready to jump and he doesn't. Now, you know, I, I can't think of any reason he didn't jump right away unless he was targeting a location. Now we, I, I understand he didn't. I don't think he specified speed. Did he specify maximum speed? Yeah, it's either below two hundred miles an hour or two hundred knots. I okay, so there you well, go. It's I mean, one yeah. of those. Don't be angry at me that I didn't get that right, but yeah, it's, it's one of those. I, 
I, I think somebody might have mentioned with the flaps and the configuration he demanded it, that it would have had close to a maximum speed anyway. That I know I don't know if he would have known that, but those two points together to me that he I wouldn't say he didn't fight them over the 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 uh, location, um, but that he denied a couple until he got one that was on the same line, and the fact that he had a window in which he could jump that he didn't. That to me seems like he could he was targeting somewhere. Now he might have been targeting a hundred mile radius or two hundred mile radius, but I think he had a general 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 idea where he wanted to land. Yes, well, I agree opinion. with you. I'll play devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. So San Francisco and Sacramento, I'm going to say no because I'm thinking right away the pilot's just going to fly to the ocean, three miles outside the coastline. Yeah, that's a good point way. as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's that could have been part of the reason he denied it. But again, we're you know this is a common theme with this. It's all of it's subjective. It's all a guess, you know. So you're definitely of the mind that this is something that was well planned and not something he scratched on a napkin the night before. Definitely, yes. And I, I I'd like to talk a little bit more on that if that's okay. A hundred percent. All right. So yeah, we went over the fuel truck, the location changes, the uh, jump time. Um, okay. Uh, let's see what else. Okay, you know he mentions that. Um, why is it taking so long to get the parachutes from McCord Air Force Base? I mean, from McCord, he he knew that it was. Uh, what does he use the terminology? Twenty minutes? No, I use it. He says twenty miles, I believe. That that actually, the more I think about that, it may actually be a a point of contention. But regardless, he had a rough estimate of how far McCord was. Which now, I I didn't drive around the Seattle area much in 1971, but uh, it could be both twenty miles and twenty minutes. Um, <laughs> around that it. time period, and today it's twenty miles and forty-seven minutes. Right. Yeah, I think somebody mentioned. Uh, they might have mapped it out. And said it was yeah, forty-five, sixty minutes, something like that. I'm remembering that. But either way, he he knew the a rough guesstimate of the distance to McCord. Now, some people might say, well, he just that is indic that suggests that he lived in the area or from close by or had history in the area. But this is another thing in Doctor uh, Edwards' book that I find really interesting is he breaks down the um, hijackers. And th these are, these are hijackers of, of all uh, intent. So these are like, you know, people that want to fly to Cuba or, you know, whatever they were hijacking the planes for. And the, it, he, he shows the, um, the percentile of, I mean, the percentage of people uh, by distance from their home or from their like home location. And then he also shows the success rate and the vast majority of people, they were successful uh, in hijacking airplanes. They were from 800 to like, I think 2,500 miles away from their, uh, their home. So it seemed like there was a trend in which people would hijack a plane from relatively far away from where they live. So that's, I, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of one reason I think maybe he wasn't from the area and the fact that he knew that the uh, uh, McCord McCord was, he obviously researched that. Oh, so and you think it's more, familiarity with a map than familiarity with the area correct yes i think he 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 selected the flight that's another big point towards planning i want to talk about and this i'm going to reference bob edwards book again if you guys haven't read it definitely read it but um he bob edwards breaks down possible restrictions he chose on the flight now this is huge i don't think that this has been um rock can correct me if i'm wrong but as far as i know none of the copycats got this one right and it's a genius thing that he did was he selected a terminating flight so that means it's a flight where everybody's getting off the plane. Nobody's expected to get on the plane. And he and obviously knew that. It wasn't a coincidence. I, that's what I feel like, and I'll tell you why, and this is articulated in the book, is that he um, Northwest uh, Airlines was one of only five, five airlines that disclosed um, whether or not it was a um, 727 or a DC-9. Those are the only two with ventral air stairs in which he could have jumped out of. And then Dr. Edwards goes on even deeper and says, okay, we got to assume that he wants to jump in the lower 48, which is reasonable. Of course that, you know, you don't want to jump in Hawaii. He'll take you out over the ocean and you don't want to land in the Alaskan mountains either. And then uh, he says, uh, what are all the restrictions? Terminating flight. It has to be published. That's a, a, a 727, a puddle jump, which I think is definitely correct. He wanted to give the authorities the perfect window of time uh to get him his stuff and not set up to capture him so it really puts them under the gun exactly yes and and you know he makes his demands and then by selecting the shortest possible flight it basically is you're ready to get the stuff as soon as it's available that's pretty much what that does by picking such a short flight so that's one of the restrictions ventral air stuff published terminating flight 
and then um, lower 48. Uh, I think that might have been it, but if he, once he gets done with but the restrictions... But also holiday weekend. Well, that's well. He he assumes it's on uh, that day, you know, the day before Thanksgiving. So he um, ends up with there's only there was only nine flights in the country that that fit that criteria. In, in my opinion, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that he saw that stuff out. Now he may not have had a comprehensive, uh, you know, search for everything in the country, but I think he looked at Northwest Airlines and he saw that they published it. There was one, like you said, on the holiday, and one that uh, you know. They he could see there was a seven twenty seven and it was a puddle jump and it landed somewhere that was two thousand miles away from a foreign country that he could utilize the maximum range of the plane like we went over before, so that the, all that together I know that's a, that was a long way to explanation but that's a big point to me that I think shows that he was really really well planned and unique among all the copycats I don't think any of the other copycats had that level of detail in their flight selection I'd agree with that and obviously they didn't consider enough about this to pull it off like cooper did yeah but if yes. he planned this so well drew why did he choose a night jump because if he's the detail of planning you're talking about he mm -hmm. knows that it's going to be dark by 4 35 o'clock and he doesn't get on a plane until 2 50 right yes and that's that's the that's the criteria i missed that dr bob edwards lays out is that he he, he wanted it to be a night jump which to me seems Especially if I wasn't a parachutist, I would want to jump at night because I'd be scared that the planes are, you know, it's ground surveillance or whatever, helicopters, I don't know what's coming after me. I'd be scared they could see me more easily in the daytime. And I feel like I would probably have a smoother, uh, you know, I'd be able to uh, get out of there and get on the road easier at nighttime as well. Less people out and about if you land somewhere you didn't intend, you know, on a road or, you know, in a neighborhood or whatever. But if I'm doing a night jump, why don't I do a night jump in Kansas or Nebraska? Why am I doing a night jump in the Pacific Northwest? Right. If and if you look at that, that like I laid out in Dr. Bob Edwards' book, those nine flights, that there's none. The, the only one that I think perhaps would have had better conditions was one that I think ended in Tampa, Tampa Bay. Uh, the other ones were Detroit, Chicago, uh, maybe Milwaukee or something like that. Uh, and then the the thing with Florida, I, I don't think that he wanted to land uh, like you've pointed out earlier, give them the opportunity to uh, fly out over the ocean dump him there i think the night jump was intentional i'll say that and i think that it was a he he picked the flight that's like that's just the most likely scenario to me it's definitely not concrete it's not for sure but um it's too big a coincidence i think to be the absolute optimal flight to select and he just happens to land on it that's it that's a really good point and i've mm -hmm. i've always said that he knows it's going to be a night jump if he has any familiarity with the Pacific Northwest, if he would have had any access to a newspaper that listed sunrise and sunset roundabout time, mm -hmm. uh, he would have known like by five o'clock in that area of the Pacific Northwest, it is straight up dark right. at that time in November. Yeah, but again, I think I think he saw the night fall as an asset to him, not a hindrance. I, I definitely agree with that as well, because I believe that you're going to use a skill set that you think you have that the average man doesn't right. for this hijacking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're getting off in the uh, the the bush bushcraft survival expert guy like uh, Gossett. So you're getting that. Well, I mean, it could be Gossett. It could be Braden. It could be any number of people that have. Yeah. At that point in time, military experience. There weren't a lot of recreational skydivers that would have had night jump experience. Right. Right. Yeah. At yeah, that I point in time. yeah, yeah. I, I want us to talk about that later on too. The mil you know, Braden and uh, 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 Skip Hall and whatnot later on too. But uh, uh, on this planning wrinkle, another thing is, uh, I think Pat Bowling came on here and talked about the Elsinore ghost. Yes, you know. Now, um, that is a compelling story. I was surprised. That's another. Uh, is that new? When, when did that we learn about that? The Elsinore go ghost story has been around for quite a while, but I mean, even just the fact that it's Lyle Cameron. And he has this sordid, shady, crazy history. What, it just adds this other layer that is just so vortexy. But what I mean, what I would say to that is, what does he have to gain, or his conspiracy theory CIA employers or whatever have to gain by him making the story up? I I don't know. And that that's another thing. It's like, what did he have to gain from it? Um, yeah. Was he trying to rat someone out, which doesn't really seem. All that much, like yeah. That's no in the first place. That's one thing I, I was so, I, and I haven't read the book, so I'm not. I, I don't want to pretend like I, I have a well, super well crafted opinion on it. But 
the Skip Hall deal when they when he brought up Law Cameron. I, what is the idea there? I mean, that they both were in bed with the FBI or CIA, and they. I mean, why would he call them on Skip Hall if Skip Hall had been at the Elsmore Jump Center? Well, you'll ha- you'll have to talk to Nikki more because Nikki really went into Lyle Cameron or or John, but I, I believe Lyle was an FBI informant, and then the last phone call Jack Ruby ever right. made was to yeah. Lyle Cameron. And Lyle Cameron dies in this weird, suspicious plane crash. Yeah, I get that. I get the Jack Ruby to phone call is like a CIA or undercover link to to Lyle Cameron. But if we're also positing that Skip Hall was either employed or acting on behalf of the CIA, then it just doesn't make any sense to me that they would, uh, you know, why why he would bring up a lead to to, uh, an actual link that existed. But I definitely will have to get with John on that. I, I don't. I don't know John. I haven't ever spoken with him, but I, I certainly would like to to get his thoughts on that. And and I, I, uh, to be fair too, it didn't seem like he really pitched the Lyle Cameron angle very hard. It just kind of came up in you guys' conversation. No, the the Lyle Cameron thing. It's like, why does his name keep popping up? Why yeah. why are his fingers in every pie? It's so it is crazy to me that he caught he. I'm going to say this, the the story as best I can remember, but he calls the FBI and says the guy that looked identical to the sketch, you know, was you know, asking about jumping out of 727. And then somehow he finds out later on, like a day or two later, that he had Raleigh cigarettes on the flight and he calls back and says he had Raleigh coupons. That's that was that part about to me was very compelling if that actually happened. But I guess he could have lied. I don't again, though, I don't know why he would have lied. I, I do love the detail that Lyle, Lyle Cameron calls out. He was wearing Cochrane boots. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's so, it's crazy. Because if a, you are an insider in anything, you would know like, oh my God, that guy, that guy's wearing gear for this. I recognize mm-hmm. that. Yeah, and he, he said he had the likeness. He was asking about the 727 and he's a smoker of Raleigh cigarettes. I mean, it's almost too good to be true, which I know that's what a lot of people have said. It is not true. But uh, talking about that, uh, this was just this just came up in the Facebook group recently. Was um the uh the FBI? You know they they went down that lead. He said he's thought he'd seen him here before, and they they got a list of I think it was from the registration cards. I don't know if you have to fill one out for every jump there, or maybe when they just signed up. But they looked at the registration cards. I think from like maybe uh June or July and August of that year, maybe uh, something like that. And they looked for guys that were over thirty five, and there was four hundred thirty three people. And then they they narrowed that down to um, I think maybe thirteen or something like that by you know limiting the time a little bit more and maybe the the height and stuff like that. Well, the and age they, is just going to cut it, eliminate seventy five percent of the people that were at a drop zone in seventy one seventy two. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So they got down to thirteen people. I think the the thirteen people kind of you know condensed list was just those who registered in August, but I can't. Which is when I think Law Cameron said he saw him. But what I was getting at is uh, Ryan told me j- just yesterday that there is a document that exists that has those names listed in, in the uh, vault files, but they're all redacted, the 433 names. And I I've got, I, I think I might get him to help me with the – we were kind of kicking around this idea of getting a FOIA request put, it, put in explicitly for that, that list of 433 names. And the idea was that, you know, we got information now that the FBI wasn't working with back then that may, you know, make one of those names pop out more. That would be interesting if that could produce some some lead or some more information. Yeah, I mean, you know, you get you look at the list and you find in July that uh, you know somebody that was a uh, forty nine years old and uh, an oddball and metallurgist with sore skin signed up. Then that's, I mean, you got to look at that guy right away. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely, we do. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's that's uh, one thing I'm thinking about now. I know that's you know apparently these FOIAs take a year to two years to process. So and and he brought up the point that probably isn't likely to get one because that would require them to verify that everyone uh, you know listed was alive or dead. But another thing I'll, I'll say about the Elsinore ghost, the the people that a lot of people that, that don't believe it, they say it's not. It can't be right because. Uh, they find it likely that D.B. Cooper got his inspiration for the hijacking from Paul Sini, who had done it, I believe, two weeks earlier. Now, this is one of the things I've looked into pretty hard when I first uh, got a hold of the vault files for the first time. And I was looking for, um, you know, uh, pictures of Cooper and, I, 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 you know, or representations they put in there. And um, I found where somebody had cut out a newspaper clipping of a... Uh, a guy, uh, an image from somebody that had to hijack an airplane in Australia or put it called in a bomb threat in Australia. And they said, this guy looks like the sketch. We need to look into it. 
Well, I, I looked into that uh, that case. It's the Qantas bomb hoax. Has anybody ever talked about this on the podcast? No, I don't even think okay. I've heard of it. Okay, this is in uh, Australia. Let me look at my, I'm going to check my notes really quick. Sorry. Let's see. Where is Qantas? Qantas. I think it was in night. Okay, no, it was in 1971. It was in May of 1971. The guys in Australia, um, they call this airline Qantas, and they tell them that um, there's a bomb on the plane, and it, it has an altimeter uh, on it. And if it if you if it descends below a certain level, the bomb's going to ignite. And then they'll tell them the location of the the bomb on the plane if they uh, give them five hundred thousand dollars. And then they go on to say we've hit a we hit a bomb in locker X Y Z, and uh, at this address, and it looks it's just like the one on the on the uh, plane. And they get the FBI goes and they find it, and there's a functioning bomb with the altimeter trigger on it and everything that they actually detonated. So they said, okay, these guys they're legit. They must mean business. So it's this is the craziest part of the story to me. They decide they're going to pay the guys. They don't consult with the authorities. And I don't know where he came from, but the manager of the airport, I believe, gets five hundred thousand dollars and drives to meet the guy by himself. And he he get he gives him five hundred thousand dollars. That he drives off into the sunset, gets away with it scot free. And then uh, one of the guys, it's a, it was an older man and a younger man, and he uh, the young guy was going just going crazy with the spending. He, they said he pulled into a gas station with a different car like two or three days in a row. And they said, "Hey, we think this might be the guy." They looked into it, and they found about half the money. And they, this is kind of just a fact, but I mean, an interesting factoid. But the guys claimed that there was somebody named Mister Ken they they had never met before that put him up to, it, and he's got the rest of the money. Now that's just they were just trying to ease their sentencing, I think. But the bottom line is, those guys got caught. I believe it was uh, it was either uh, July or August of seventy one, which and, and I found, I've looked on newspapers dot com and I have found where it was circulating. I mean, it was across the country in America. The story was circulating. So that's, to me, that's always been kind of the uh, inspiration for D.B. Cooper, the most likely inspiration. Now, it's not it's not identical to the scene because he, the, the guys never jumped, but they held the plane hostage with a bomb. That gives, you know, if, if, he, if he did see that, it would give you a little bit more lead time to come up, craft something like this, I think. Yeah, and especially, you know, you could combine those two stories. You could see that, uh, is it Qantas? Qantas, airline? yeah. Yeah, Qantas yeah. Airline uh, bomb scare and be like, oh, that's interesting. And then yeah. hear the Paul Sini story and be like, oh my God, I could put those two together. Right, yeah. That's that's kind of what I've always thought. I thought he heard uh, the Qantas one and he thought somewhere along the way, I can make a better mousetrap than this, kind of. Okay, if you're of the mind, this is well planned. Mm -hmm. This is obviously a guy, he chose to jump at night. He seems to have an ability to plan something like this, an ability to execute something like this. I would say he has some parachute experience. What do you think Cooper's background is then? Uh, well, this is sort of off topic, but I this is I don't know. This is d d my biggest pet peeve with the Cooper case number is uh, that we have two pieces of physical evidence. That's it. Two. We got the money at Tina Bar and the tie, and those two things are the absolute quickest thing that people that are deep in this case want to just dismiss entirely and not consider not try to learn about it anymore or, in, you know, look into it. And in my opinion, this is a very different topic, I think, than what we're going after now. But the uh, tie, to me, is, you know, it, there's a lot of, let me, before we start talking about the tie, I got to put a big disclaimer up there. I am not a chemist or a scientist or I don't have any background with it in any way. I just really know how to use Excel decently, not that, I mean, you know, decently. And uh, what I've done is Macron Labs, they... Uh, when they scanned the sticky stubs that Tom K put together, they uh, made they provided them with Excel tables of the data of the particles. And to me, those I've spent a lot of time, you know, filtering and sorting and analyzing those particles and what they can mean and trying to uh, research what they can mean. And don't get me wrong, it's not deep research. It's mostly Google and, you know, getting opinions from others. But to me, the particles in the tie are very, very suggestive that the guy had some kind of background in Mel's R and D, and I could, I could, I could go into depth on why I think that too. Well, then let's hear it. Okay. Well, you know, if you look at the the tie, there's a like an array of uh, metals, rare metals. Titanium, obviously, is one everybody talks about, but there's also aluminum and iron and uh, silicon mixed with you know each other in a, a large swath of degrees. And not like, you know, different, different combinations. 
which to me kind of suggests that somebody's tinkering with a lot of different things. And then the thing that really got me when I first got the Excel data was there's some there's a lot of particles on uh, ele- you know particles on there that are wholly and unadulteratedly uh, comprised of just one element. And if you look at the ones that are, are completely pure, number one, you have to co- you have pure titanium. There's not a lot of it. I think it's 32 particles. Yes, 32 particles of pure titanium, which I think at the time was very rare. That's titanium without with, without even oxygen. And then uh, there's 500 silicon and seven, 373 calcium. Those are the two most populous uh, pure elements. And those are, are very, you know, those are like the most, some of the most common alloying agents. Uh, you know, so it's something that a guy in metals R and D, I think, that, as I understand it anyway. Again, I'm going to disclaim all this. I'm not an expert. This is just my opinion. So don't don't uh, hang me at sunrise. But that, along with the fact that there's a lot of iron that's completely pure, and, and I don't know. To me, that kind of indicates that he's, um, you know, working with this stuff in its natural form, and it's rare. It was like I said, it was rare at the time. There's not a lot of uh, explanations for it. Now we can get into the explanations that have been posited and kind of what I think about those as well. Let's do that. Okay, so uh, you know it, it, it's come up that the the biggest thing that is uh, come up is you know there's been a suggestion that the the t- uh, titanium particles that they're from smoking because I think that um, I think this is the case anyway I think this is why people say this is that the the those white the match heads that were white I think they contain titanium and uh, not only that but I think that maybe there's been a thought that perhaps striking even a match that didn't contain titanium that it could uh you know go molten and uh you know blend in with those other compounds and sort of make something that wasn't titanium but that the electron microscope might have misread apparently apparently these elements the way the electron microscope works is that it, it shoots the electrons into the particles and they vibrate and based on those vibrations the electron microscope uh, I can't believe I'm saying all this. I'm probably getting it all wrong, but <laughs> the electron microscope reads the frequency of the vibration, and some of these elements have similar peaks, so they could be misidentified as uh, the wrong thing. So I think that's that. Those two things in conjunction: number one, the 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 matches had uh, titanium in them, or number two, they um, burnt up together and it made something that the electron microscope misread. To address those two things, number one. You know, I don't think again. This is not. I'm just. This is from what I've Googled and researched in very limited scope. But I don't think that those particles would be very likely to contain zero percent oxygen. And Nikki Nikki Broughton, his metallurgist that he consults with, he said the same thing that zero percent oxygen is suggestive of an alloy. You know, and there's there's a lot of that on the tie with these metals, but. Even in the case that if it did burn up and uh, you know go molten and suck all the oxygen out. The these the titanium is very very high weight. I mean it's it's makes up. If you look at it, what I did one thing I did was I broke out the uh, titanium richness in the on the particles. So like I like bucketed the 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 uh, the particles by how rich it was in titanium and try to look and see if like you know I would think if it was from a match if you're striking a match and it's burning up and it's this violent process that's blended with other elements that you'd have a very very random distribution of zero percent oxygen titanium. But that's uh, that's just not what we see. It's it's most of it is very high weight titanium, and then the parts that do that that are sm- you know smaller range of titanium, uh you know in theory from a, if you're striking a match they should contain uh high degrees of potassium or and or chlorine, and the 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 ones with low weight titanium that have no oxygen, they uh there's not there's those two particles are not super well represented. It's mostly iron based, which to me in- indicates he was alloying iron with titanium in high weights of iron. So I, I don't know. I, I know that it's, it's, I'm not trying to say that it's, this is for sure. Nothing in this case period is for sure, but certainly not with the ties, not for sure. But um, that's just kind of what I, my very, very uneducated uh, look at it is based on the stuff that I have seen. The tie is really interesting. You, you know, you talk about, we have two pieces of physical evidence, the tie and Tina bar. That's it. That's all we got. And Boy, it doesn't really point us in any direction. The tie is super mysterious with super rare elements. And then we've got Tina Barr, which I'm sure we'll get into later. That's yeah. obviously quite a quandary. Yeah, I, I want to say this to everybody that says that that has that sentiment on the tie. What else are you going to do? I mean, this is the this is one of the only possible avenues that there is to to try to narrow this the new you know the the funnel. I mean, it's not there. 
I agree that it's could it's very low chance to get anything valuable, but there's not many better ways to waste your time that could actually produce anything that could uh, shrink the the pool of potential uh, candidates. I mean, there uh, if there is, you please tell me. I just don't know of one. Yeah, and I mean, it's not like the only thing we found on the tie was salt and pepper and and sawdust and a pollen that's common across the United States. Yeah. It's no, we found these insanely rare combination of metals and minerals and it's baffling and we can only think of a few industries and that should, it should narrow the suspect pull down quite a bit, mm-hmm. but it, it doesn't really seem to do that. I mean, we have new suspects yeah. that are directly from the tie in Vordal and Peterson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, and I, I'd like to talk about that some too if I can. But the yeah, let's uh, go right into it. Okay, so this is uh, yeah, you know, Verdal, Verdal and Peterson, they they are rim crew in general. Let's just say rim crew. Okay, it that that came up as a topic or a a lead, an angle, because um, uh, they're relying on three particles on the tide that are particularly rare. They contain uh. Uh, they're primarily titanium all 70 plus percent and then they have high degrees of antimony which i think is very odd and i haven't looked at this hard i guess i've kind of taken their word for it but from what i understand they there's not a lot of uh excuses for that uh uh alloy combination and there's again these are zero percent oxygen particles so either some freak final destination type struck a match and it burned up and made the perfect falsity or it's alloy anyway they they looked at that because rim crew had a patent issued or i think there's two patents but there's one in the tie era as they say you know between 19 we know that okay let's that's another thing we know that the tie was sold uh but 1963 or four is the first year eligible i know that and i think maybe they stopped in 66 or something like that but the tie era you know at, at, at large is 1964 to 1971 when he hijacked the plane so what nikki and uh and ryan and chris uh brower uh did uh which was very very smart they had a great approach they looked for uh, patents that uh, contained that, that explained that alloy because it's, it never became popular. And they found one with Rim Crew. Now, like I said, whenever that's when I thought maybe this case gets solved when I heard that story from Ron. Ron told me when I got into the group, Ron told me about Vordal and whatnot. I was really excited about it. So I thought, man, I, I want to get some more um, information about this. So I, I looked up the patent and read through it. And the patent, you know, the three particles that they, they flagged. They uh contain all of them contain nickel. Now the reason nickel is important when you look at the top particles is because apparently the sticky stubs uh I don't know if they're actually on this in, I don't know if they're if it's in the sticky stubs or if they were embedded in them like the process to stick them on and remove them, but there was nickel wires that can potentially contaminate the st- sticky stubs. Those three particles contain nickel. Now the the the, the alloy that's in this patent with the uh, rim crew and Milton board all. It does not contain nickel, but you know, basically what I'm getting at is there's a perilous connection to begin with because you have to assume that the nickel that exists in those three particles was contamination to get you know to even tie it to room crew. So that's that's the first step that I don't think a lot of people know about that uh, kind of throws them in a little bit more perilous light than I think that some people suggest. Now the second thing is uh, this alloy; it's not like if you read that patent, they're not they're not proprietizing the alloy. It's mentioned almost offhand. It's like there uh Milton Vordal has uh I don't know if he created or is testing this strengthening process in which he he uh heats up the metal and stretches it in certain dimensions and then he does pressure tests on it to see if it becomes stronger. And that alloy just happens to be listed at, uh, among many that he tested for this process. So it's not the patent was not like, hey, I created this alloy. It's just like I applied tests to this alloy. Now, obviously, when I learned all this, I, I looked really, really hard myself to try to find a separate patent that explains it. And, I, you know, you see a lot of patents that uh, say that they use titanium and antimony. It's, it is very, very, very rare. But the, a lot of them don't disclose the percentages used. And um, also, another thing, too, I learned looking at all this, 60% of all patents are rejected. Or maybe 60% are successful, something like that. There's a staggering amount that are rejected and aren't documented. So um, I say all this to basically say, oh, and then the other the other possibility that exists is somebody tested this stuff, and they just didn't bother to document it, 
or because they wasn't useful to them. I, well, all I'm getting at is that this is a long winded way to say that it's there. There could be another explanation out there that we have yet to find. But you you're still thinking Cooper was a metallurgist. I do, yes, because like I said earlier, there's a lot more than three particles that suggest that. There's the the array of of what seems to be alloyed metal, rare metals, and then there's also the uh, the fact that there's so many pure uh, elements that. Uh, in my opinion, anyway, suggests that he was working with these things, you know, from the ground up to create stuff and test stuff. And there's also a lot of corrosive stuff that suggests corrosive testing, which I think was really uh, prevalent to a metallurgist in R&D. You know, they'd make alloys and they would try to corrode them to see how well they do. One other thing, too, I want to point out about the uh, the titanium antimony particles. Tom K presented that. I did was not there, unfortunately. I haven't watched it because the video was not, it was hard to discern it, but I, this has been summarized to me after the fact. Tom K, you know, I mentioned earlier that some particles have a similar, or elements rather, have a similar uh, peak point so they can be misidentified. Apparently, calcium and antimony is, or is one of those situations. So I think uh, it's been suggested that there's a high uh, probability that the titanium antimony is actually titanium calcium, which is a lot more explainable, I understand. Okay, so if, if Cooper is a metallurgist, how many metallurgists would choose a night jump and know about a 727's flight configuration for doing so? Right, and that's exactly those though the marriage of those two points that you're getting at to me. I, you know, that's why I think there's no way that he learned about this two weeks beforehand and they made this whole thing up. I think he thought of it when he saw the Qantas hoax, or maybe he just dreamed it up. I don't know. And I think he spent a long, long time learning this stuff. You know. I think he went to Elsinore and decided, you know, said, show me how to jump and can I jump out of the 727? I think that he looked at all the flights like we went through. And I think that, uh, you know, I think he spent his time. Oh, another thing, too, about the planning. He brought Benzedrine on the plane. Now, a lot of people say, OK, that must mean that he used Benzedrine regularly, which that, that may be the case, too. But I mean, I, I take high blood pressure medication. I, I don't think I would take that with me to hijack a plane if I was going to do so. I think that he thought I'm going to get fatigued or. The pilots may get fatigued, and then this is going to be, uh, you know, something that I can offer to them to be, make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, or I mean, this could go long, <laughs> and right. I might may be tired. Yeah, I think that I think all those things, like we're getting at over and over again, I think he planned this thing really, really well. Or I, okay, you can you can debate if it was well or well executed. I think that he spent a lot of time planning it. That's what I want to get at. Does your metallurgist Cooper suspect? Does he have military experience? Uh well I don't have a suspect I've definitely I've read a hundreds of obituaries you would be stunned I couldn't I had never heard of a metallurgist when this all came out there's a ton of metallurgists born between 1915 1925 uh yeah I mean everybody had military experience then everybody did everyone did now I will say surprisingly one of the guys I I have spent a lot of time looking at uh he did, did not he was I don't but he did he supported the military. Uh, but that guy's not D.B. Cooper. Well, so I could say that with confidence. How many, uh, w with without naming them specifically or anything, mm -hmm. how many people were you like, I got to research this guy? Oh, a lot. Wait, I, especially when I first started, uh, when I first got the newspapers.com, and when I first kind of felt like, uh, for a while, I thought it was Milton Ford Dahl, like, close the book kind of vibe. And then uh, when I started to think, maybe there's more out there. That's I, I mean, every guy I found that I, the story is, Type in newspapers, you know, keyword survived by, that gets you the obituaries. Keyword metallurgist or metallurgical or chemist or engineer or whatever, flight engineer. And then also another thing too, we'll get into this. I think it was probably, it's very likely that he was or had experience as a pilot. That's another keyword I stick in there a lot. But, uh, you know, I find the obituary that fits it and then I go to Ancestry. If the guy's ruddy or, or, or uh, uh, swarthy, uh, you know, dark complexion and, and six feet on his military card. I think I'm gonna vet him out. Yeah. You know? So what? Give me a number. How many? How many? How many people have I, you soup? Have you researched the ones that you know get to that draft card process? I mean, it's it could be hundred. I don't know. It could, could be could get close <laughs> to it. I, I, it's a, it's a sickness, man. This thing's a sickness. It says the guy. Oh, I have no. I never thought about solving it myself. I, I, that's it's aptly named. Your podcast is aptly named. It's a vortex. It's you think you're just. Swimming around, laughing at everybody else, and it sucks you down. Oh, it certainly does. Did Cooper survive the jump? Yes, I do think so. Let me get to my section on that really quick. Okay. Yeah, okay. Number one, I would point to uh, 
Martin Andrade, you know, he has the the uh really, really well done research where he looks at the uh survival rates of emergency ejections and whatnot. To me, that was the first thing when I learned that I thought, okay, he must have survived. And then the second thing is the copycats, they some of them didn't have any skydiving experience like Martin McNally and still survives. I mean and then the uh, the the biggest thing I think is that uh he I think if he had died, the FBI would have caught this guy. I mean, identified him quickly. I think somebody would have said that uh, you know, his uh neighbor or his you know wife or missing person reports etc i think it'd be too easy for them to you know pick pick the guy out i know but men disappeared then between mm. let's say 30 and 50 well i mean if you if you disappeared any on, on on that day and you looked like the sketch i think that there would there would have been a phone call made uh, that's a good point that's a good yeah point. I, I don't know i think that's too way to unless he was a complete total loner unemployed or if it's a situation like, um, like you know, that positive that's in the, um, in um, the Max Gunther book where he's you know kind of it vanished beforehand, that'd be the only way. I don't. If he died, I think it had to be a scenario like that where he was already off the radar. That's a good point. He he could have disappeared from his family in '68. Yeah, and then and they yeah. wouldn't report him missing because you know he went to get a pack of smokes and never came back. And then we're not linking him to the hijacking in 71 because it was May of 68 when he went to the convenience store and never came back. Right. Yeah. And, I, I, and I've looked I, I have oftentimes expanded my my own personal searching to uh, include periods before then, you know, a couple of years before for, for that kind of a scenario. Was his bomb real? You know, that I had always assumed the bomb was, was real, and I'll tell you why. It's because, um, you know, he demands that they bring the money and bring a knapsack. And they bring up, like, as Jude Mar calls it, the Looney Tunes bag that's uh, just unsealable <laughs> and wide open and whatnot. Now, this uh, okay, this is another thing, too, I hate. I hate this. This is off-topic from the question, but when people say, look at him, he's a damn dope. He, he, didn't, he didn't say, I'm going to blow your damn head off if you don't bring me this knapsack. I think that he did that because I think the reason he didn't press is because he thought this isn't a big deal. I can just tie it up and it, I'm going to lose equity by allowing the FBI more time to uh, pin me than I would lose by just MacGyvering, if you will, this bag shut. Now, OK, what I was getting at about the bomb is he um, says, that, you know, it's not a big deal. Don't bring me the knapsack. Now, if if the bomb, I would, this was my thought anyway, if the bomb was fake. I thought what he would do is just leave the bag and then whenever he sends Tina up, dump the contents of the fake bomb out and then just stash as much of the money as he could in the briefcase and then in his pockets, etc. I think he could get close. I mean, you know, you know, as it's been talked about before, it's really not that big of a mass that that two hundred thousand dollars in 20. So uh, so that's the reason I always saw the bomb was was fake. I mean, it was uh, real. But when you had your episode with the bomb expert, is that Mike Vining? Is that right? Mike Vining. Mike Vining. And he said, uh, you know, the description of the battery source was way too big. That shut the door to me. I think that's basically we got to assume the bomb was uh, was fake at this point. I hate to be the guy that disagrees with an expert that knows way more than me. <laughs> but I just I was frustrated by Mike Vining's answers about the bomb. Oh, yeah. And, you were the same way with the, the numerologist, right? I mean, I could tell it here in your voice. Yeah. And I, I was... Both of those interviews I was unhappy with. It it wasn't for their answers. It was just, I'm used to this sort of D.B. Cooper discussion, I guess. And when I interview someone that doesn't have much to say on Cooper, right. but has a lot well, to say about one specific topic. And, you know, we've always like, oh, yeah, Cooper obviously spent the money. No one would find it. It's not a big deal. There's this many avenues uh -huh. that it could have been switched out, blah, blah, blah. And then he, the numismatist, he's just like, well, the odds that $9,020 bills go into circulation and not a single of them comes up in a flag transaction is right. just it's statistically impossible. Yeah. And there's a, I'll say this too. I don't know if you know about this and man, I wish I could give the guy credit. I can't think of his name, but there's a guy in the Facebook group that has created an, an AI uh, run program that is constantly searching auction sites for the, uh, the star notes that fit the serial numbers. And, you know, okay. I, I talked to Ryan about this and here uh, is the big problem I have about this. The idea that someone that collects currency uh -huh. would accidentally post 
1969 Series A star bill, huh? not knowing it's a Cooper bill, is so ridiculous. You think that so? I, I, I'm not even going to tolerate that at all because, okay, l- Drew, let's say that you collect Corvettes and you love Corvettes and you know everything about Corvettes and the history and blah, blah, blah. You live and breathe Corvettes. Right. Are yeah, you going to be aware of a series of VIN numbers of Corvettes that are super rare because this and this happened? And do you think the average guy who knows about that event in Corvettes will know that and not you? No. Yeah. You would well, know, okay, yeah, these Corvettes with this certain VIN number, those are incredible and we all know the reason why. If you're a collector of currency and you see a 69 Series A star bill, probably your first thought is Cooper's money. Because well, okay. it's so much more valuable than twenty dollars. A nineteen sixty nine twenty dollar bill is worth like forty bucks. Yeah, it's not valuable. Yeah, yeah, I remember him saying that, which I was surprised by. But I'll, I'll say this to that point is that the reason that this gentleman uh, put together this this software was because he wanted to find money that was out there that the guy had not identified was Cooper. If the collector knew that it was Cooper's bill, he would have just made Cooper. You know, I mean, we would know that he spent the money in either scenario. This is just this is the I think the idea behind this was just to catch the ones that weren't identified by the collector. That's a good you point. Know? Yeah. And and I'm I'm totally for it and I'm I appreciate it. It's just that the idea that collectors someone selling an old 20 is is someone that's in that and into money and into currency. I mean, maybe there's a chance that someone found some old bills and thought maybe ah, okay. Right, yeah, that's... I'm, I'm still for it. I'm still for it, but yeah. anyone that collects money would know there's this batch of Cooper bills and maybe they exist. Maybe they don't because there isn't a more valuable $20 bill from the 1960s than one of Cooper's ransom. Right. Yeah. But again, that it'd be that scenario. Like you laid out, like uh, somebody's grandpa died and they, they were just, uh, you know, he had some $20 bills that were star notes in an envelope that he must've been collecting. And I don't know anything about collect, you know, that, that guy in that scenario doesn't know anything about collecting bills and he just posts them on the auction site. What do you think happened to Cooper's money? Okay, that's a yeah, that's another that's a good question. I meant to cover this kind of in the Tina Bar section, but that's all we can talk about it here. So, um, yeah, obviously, what uh, happened to fifty eight hundred to sixty thousand to six thousand of it? Right, that's what I was gonna say. I, I meant to talk about this when we talked about Tina Bar and his survival rate. So, uh, so we've got covered the Western flight path. I think we agree it's the. I mean, the, I'm sorry, the FBI flight path is correct. So that that rules out almost entirely. A, the possibility of a landing in walking distance of Tina Bar. Now, that means that you have to assume that the money got to Tina Bar one of two ways. Either it was human intervention in some capacity, you know, a plant or somebody carried it there for reasons we don't understand, or it was by natural means. Now, I, I'm of the opinion, and and we we know that the the of course the uh, diatoms indicate that the money got wet in the springtime of a year. It could not have been the night of the hijacking. So I know uh, this is not a good opinion among people that are deep into the vortex as me, but I think all the signs point to – all the uh, evidence points to the most likely scenario is that it was by human intervention. I mean, it's just the with, between the diatoms and the, the, the quality of the money. Like I said, when he, when he jumped out of the um, – when he jumped out of the plane or when Tina last saw him, he had the bag basically cocooned. I mean, it was wrapped – vertically and horizontally like i said so basically if you're saying that he got there by natural means the money got there by natural means he jumped out of the plane he lost the money somehow was tied to him now that's not impossible it could rip the cord or whatever that was tied to him it lands in a place that's dry it's uh in a place that is susceptible susceptible to flooding the it floods in the springtime which i think there was one in maybe 1976 i think is the one that everybody targets and not only does it flood, but it floods. It somehow it gets snagged on a branch or a log or something. It can't. It won't float on its own. It rides the log all the way down to Tina Bar, which is like a minimum, I think, of eleven water miles, depending on where you think he jumped. And then uh, it washes up on Tina Bar, or uh, some money burst out, and it's only three bills. Nothing else is there. No parachute. No rest of the money. No bag. No body or anything. It's just those three bills remain. And then somehow the rest of it gets carried down. So I, I don't know. To me, that's like the I, I, I'm not going to hear Chris Cunningham rolling his eyes from here, but that's not I don't think that's very likely that to me. That's like cosmic odds. 
So I think that the die times and the the fact that the quality of the money that was the, the nature of how clean it was and um uh the rubber bands, I think all that kind of goes in together to um suggest that it was by human intervention. Now that's weird as hell. Don't get me wrong. I don't I don't like that because it doesn't really make a lot of sense on this the face. But uh, I just think that's the the most reasonable explanation. And I, I think that I, I'll say that the, some reasons he could he. Uh, obviously by human intervention really the only scenario is either somebody else finds it's not him and for some reason they put it there which i can't even dream up any scenario like that but uh you know it could the money could have been planted there which that's i know that sounds conspiracy theory tinfoil hat type but i think that there's a chance that he jumps this is kind of the most likely scenario to me he like i said he came up with a pretty good plan so he's obviously you know well researched and smart guy and he lands with the money keeps it and he uh, realizes there's a potential that it could be, uh, you know, the serial numbers could be tracked. So he sits on the money to wait for them to publicize it, which they did. They put it out public knowledge. Have you seen these bills? And he sees that they, uh, you know, they have the serial numbers tracked. So he says, well, hell, I can't spend this money, but man, I sure do feel like I'm on top of the world because I'm this guy that just got away with this heist and nobody can catch me. He gets obsessed with the idea. And then several years later, he feels like he's fading out of the zeitgeist or whatever, and he just wants a little, another, you know, taste of that. So he goes and sticks it there. I mean, that's one explanation. It's far fetched, but unfortunately, I think it's less far fetched than the uh, final destination: money lands, floods, drags on a log, rips out three bill, uh, three bundles. They stack up perfectly. The Berber van stay intact. It self buries. I don't know. I just think that both scenarios to me are cosmic odds, but. And it's probably close, close to a coin flip, but I think I like uh, the, the human intervention one I laid out there. Do you think that the money being planted on Tina Bar is an homage to Tina Mucklow? You know, I don't know. I don't. I, that's that's crazy to me. I don't. It's. I mean, can't rule anything out. Like I said, everything's subjective, but uh, I don't think that's very like. That seems way too far fetched to me. Well, if that's going to be far fetched, then is Dan Cooper also an homage? Because yes. we have these two things that are. Oh, well, is Tina Barr connected to Tina Mucklow? Is Dan Cooper connected to Dan Cooper the comic? Well, I mean, that's you bring up a good point. I, I, I do feel like the comic book is related, where I'm sure we're going to get into that soon. But uh, you got to bring up a good point. If it is like I laid out some kind of ideological or like, uh, you know, thought based plant there, then that, that, that would, I mean, the Tina, the t- unfortunately, the Tina connection is probably the only thing that makes sense. Uh, I assume, you know, I, when you asked somebody that recently, I thought, man, I hope, did anybody look for Radicek? Is there a Radicek way or a, uh, <laughs> you know, an Anderson uh, trail or something like that? Maybe we need to look around. That's a really good point. Yeah, I, that's a joke, just for, for everybody, so you don't you don't yell at me. But, it's uh, not a joke. We need to look for those locations. <laughs> uh, another thing, too, I'll say, and this has been brought up a lot, and everybody, you know, gets a eye roll, is that he could have planted it there with the intention that he wanted the FBI to think he was dead, like they already did. Now, obviously, you know, the first thing everybody will say that doesn't make sense for that is they, he would plant it at the drop zone. If I would put it at Lake Merwin. Right, exactly, yeah. And that, that's, that's where they that's looked. A, that's a good thought, except for, I mean, one thing I thought about uh, with that um, is that he, um, you know, he knows he didn't land at Lake Merwin, and he doesn't know if maybe the FBI is, you know, aware of where he landed. You know, like he might have, in other words, he knows, okay, they got the drop zone off, but here we are, is it eight years or nine years? I'm sorry. Eight nine years. years. Nine, uh, here we are nine years later, and uh, they still haven't caught me, but hell, they probably figured out where I jumped. Or they they might know more information about it, and I, and I know I landed somewhat close, you know, within 20 miles of the Columbia or whatever, uh, whatever he wants to say. I don't I mean, I'm not trying to say that's where the drop zone was, but he might have thought, that if he put it at Lake Merwin, then the FBI would have known that that was not reasonable because he didn't jump anywhere near there. That's a good point. And then the, the last, the last thing I'll say about the the human intervention, uh, I think, uh, this is a really, really way low probability, kind of almost a joke as well. But the uh, the Fazios there, they had. Did you know they had the history of cattle mutilations there? Oh yeah. So that unless you're crazy as hell, cattle mutilations mean there's a hoaxer around. So I, I, there could be a possibility. Or that, UFO. <laughs> unless you're crazy as hell. I, I qualify it that way. Oh, people but, who are into UFOs are crazy as hell, Drew? <laughs> not necessarily. Well, I mean, I don't think the UFOs are mutilating cows. I'll say that. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. The, uh, the It could be a hoaxer. The guy could have been getting his kicks on it. But now what that the big problem with that is, that is an in-depth hoax to, you know, 
create fake serial numbers on is it fifty eight hundred bills were had serial how many do, do we know how many of them had serial numbers uh legible you know i don't know the answer to that i know it's between like fifty eight hundred dollars and six thousand dollars but i don't know mm. how many specific bills they were able to pull serial numbers off of but then i mean at that point you're also talking about not just a hoax on the community you're talking about pulling a hoax on the fbi which is well yeah i mean people do it i i mean it's that's Nobody, I, I will never understand why somebody makes crop circles or mutilates cows or whatever. It doesn't, none of it makes sense in my brain. So, well, because some of it's probably aliens, obviously, Drew. Yeah, could have. Yeah. I, well, hell, maybe an alien put the money there. That's a, the third uh, door number three. Well, I did watch Marvel's Loki series where Cooper <laughs> disappeared midair in the daytime. I, I missed that. Did they, did he, did they have three bundles flash off and? They and had teleported. they didn't have bundles flash off, but they had a handful of bills scatter around oh, the air, yeah, which so I liked. But they, my they only the... problem is it's a daytime jump. Well, it's so Why much prettier for the camera. It, it is, yeah. yeah but you you could have like lit his face or done something. Have him jump at night. Well, you don't get the the blue popping with all the clouds and everything. They're not. I don't think they're gonna spend the CGI for the nighttime jump, so you can you know look like Blade Two. Okay, so how does your metallurgist Cooper know the flight configuration for jumping? Yeah, again, I think it's just, I think he got, you know, uh, probably, like I said, he probably was a pilot, so he knew he had aviation experience. And the reason why, I, I think people have already said this on the podcast, but the reason why I feel like he's a pilot is um, he, uh, you know, he had that line where they're stalling with the, the uh, to take off after it's been refueled. He says, what's taking so long? They say to him, we're waiting for IFR clearance. And then he replies back to them, uh, no, we, we can pick that up in the air. Now, uh, that doesn't mean anything to me, but people smarter than me in the Vortex have found out that that's flight talk. And, uh, you know, I've seen multiple times where pilots in, in the groups have been asked, uh, you know, is this pilot talking? They say, for sure, that def that's pilot lingo. So that's why I think he's a pilot. Now, I will say somebody recently brought up, I think this was Chris Cunningham, but that line, that, 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 uh, uh, line was recorded by Paul Soderlin and he thinks that it could be, uh, I don't want to put words in Chris's mouth, but I think that he suggested maybe he misinterpreted it and it was actually Ratichek, you know, kind of the like, same thing with the Amer circulated American currency. Some people say, did Cooper say that? Or did he say, give me money? And then Bill Ratichek translated that to circulated American currency. So that same caveat exists. He might not be a pilot, but in my opinion, if he really did say that, he almost certainly is a pilot. And we are playing a game of telephone because at a minimum, it's Cooper telling Tina, who's telling someone in the mm. cockpit who is then radioing that information. Yeah, and I, and I know that he was a very articulate and, uh, guy, but I don't know. It's He must be on the extreme end if he changed money to circulated American currency. I never understood that, uh, that one, but... Especially someone with no accent. Yeah. They were like, okay, this guy had a really, really heavy British accent. Right, yeah, yeah. So now, oh, yeah, you were asking me, why does the metallurgist ha know about the flight configuration? I think that's why. It's because, number one, he was, he was, uh, you know, uh, a pilot. And number two, obviously, it goes back to the range question. He got a manual or some kind of literature about the 727 and, um, you know, diagnosed that was uh, what it could do. And what he, what he, what the conditions he needed. As a matter of fact, I think did Lyle Cameron not? I think part of his testimony, he said he told the guy, you know, flaps less than twenty five degrees speed of X. I think Lyle Cameron may have said that he gave him the uh, details there. It, you know, if we're going back to the Elsinore ghost. But do you think he has jump experience? I think very little, and I'll say why I think that is is that the packing card thing to me it tells you he doesn't have jump experience. Now so it's crazy to me that some people suggest that means that he does have jump experience. Because he, if you're suggesting that he looked at the shoots and he had a document tell him this one is worse than this one and he took the worst one, that does not I, that doesn't add up to me. And then I, uh, something else that always has kind of bothered me on the whole packing card thing is that we we just assume uh, probably most likely rightly so, but it's assumed that it's ironclad that that packing card belonged to the parachute he took. I mean. There, I, it, I don't, I can't think of very many good explanations why the why it was in there other than it was an error the day that you know they rigged the things. But um, Ron did a good job one time. He walked through how it looked like, uh, based on the FBI memos, the day that it was collected versus the day that um they were uh summarized, suggested that maybe the packing cart had been pulled out of the shoot that he took, 
and he just discarded it to the ground because I think that maybe it's it's didn't say that it was with the I can't remember exactly why he did it, but somehow he deduced that and he explained it and it made it made sense as a possibility that he had pulled the packing cart out, discarded it, and then the guy comes into the plane, he picks up what's left, and he just says, Oh, I guess this is supposed to go in here, he slides it in. And then when that second memo is drafted where he details this packing cart says, you know, this rig, uh, this ca canopy size and et cetera, that he mentions that it's slotted in there together. So if uh, in either scenario, either he looked at both of them, he picked the crappier one, or if he just happened upon that one and discarded it. So in my, I don't, in my opinion, it's uh, that suggests that he didn't know a lot about parachutes, but he, he knew enough to get one off. Yeah, but if you don't know a lot about parachutes, are you going to plan a night jump in the Pacific Northwest? Well, I don't know if you if you are, are a lifelong loser, a geeky old guy, and you hear about this Qantas bomb hoax, you're having a semi men life crisis, and you think, damn, I'm smart as hell, but I, I hadn't just hadn't capitalized on my life. I'm going to go down to Elsinore and find out if I can do this thing. I mean, maybe so. Yeah, it could be crazy enough to do it. What do you think Cooper's age says about this? Because I've said this before. You know, if I told you there was this daring skyjacking and he jumped out of the plane, you would assume 25. Right. Yeah. Or, or yeah, 30. Young, younger than, than 40 to 50 for sure. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. To me, it's hell, it says that he was an uh, oddball and he was something, probably something drove him to that. Like I said, it could be a midlife crisis or some kind of other uh, critical need like money or I know people have brought up before, uh, you know, his relatives got got in with organized crime and owes a lot of money or something to that effect. I don't know. That's that's anybody's guess, I think. Yeah, I just think the age is so mysterious. It's not. It is. Yeah. And that's that, part of it. I, I find compelling, uh, you know, relative to the copycats. There's it's very uh, there was one guy. I can't remember his name, but there was one that was close to his age. But the guy didn't even jump. He, he, he wussed out on the jump. What do you think of the fact that? They released two sketches about a year apart, and they're very different looking. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, You know, this is, I wanted to point this out. I don't think anybody's talked about this on the podcast yet either, and this comes from Ron Burns. But, uh, you know, he have you heard the story about how he found the um, the memo where they suggested to create Comp B? Uh, the guy, the FBI agent, sees a um, testimony from one of the stewardess that said... Um, this sketch is awful. It doesn't look anything like him. And he, the, the, at the time, the FBI agent assumes that he's referencing Comp A. But something about the dating, I think it was the night of the hijacking, he could tell that um, he was actually referring to that very first initial, like, etch-a-sketch looking thing. You know what I'm talking about? The first sketch? Yeah. So, to, and, and then he, around also went on to, you know, show, and I think this is on norjack.org. That's a, one, another thing I want to shout out really quick. Everybody, you need to utilize norjack.org if you're not already use, utilizing it. That's Ron Burns' website. And something else I should have mentioned during the tie is um, Nick, Nikki Broughton and Chris Brower and uh, Tom K have organized a GoFundMe. And they were um, they are raising money for – Macrone Labs has offered to um, – for those of you who don't know, that's who did the initial test on the uh, sticky stubs. And they um, – or – uh, Macron Labs has agreed to retest up to four t sticky stubs at uh, just the cost of their the opportunity cost of their microscope time, which I think is five hundred dollars a uh, per stub. So um, to everybody who poo poos the tie and is a naysayer, this is your chance. Get, fund this thing, and then we'll get more because you know we, we'll have if the, it comes back that oh it was titanium calcium or there's other things that come back that read differently along the same particle than that. Uh, takes away credibility from the tie. So it's something, and I think that uh, it's one of the few things that you can actually do to help, I think. So I, I, can you put that in the episode description? Is that a possibility? Or? Absolutely. And I, I yeah. appreciate you mentioning that because this is yeah. something where you're in the vortex and you could actually legitimately help solve this case. This right, is exactly. actionable. This is something we can do. This is something that can move the case forward. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, definitely do that. Now, what we were talking about the sketches, right? Right. So Ron has uh, pointed out, Ron Burns pointed out that um, the memos, uh, when they prepared Comp B, that per, when they created it, the memo where he called to action to do that was the, um, an a, whatever FBI agent it was that crafted that memo. He uh, is looking back at um, one of the stewardess's testimony saying that the sketch uh, that they did have didn't look anything like uh, the suspect. And, but he looked at the dating on that uh the apparently that memo referenced the the first uh referenced a different memo and the dating of that memo 
uh, suggested that that the sketch that they're referring to was uh, the very, very first one, the one that they made the night of the hijacking that where he looks really young. He's got a lot of hair. Yeah, a lot of hair, very suave looking, very generic yeah. movie star looking thing. Right. Yeah. And that he so this guy sees this this description, how awful it is, but she's actually referring to a different sketch. And then Ryan went on to it on Norjack.org. If you guys go there, you can see he has all the sketches laid out and everybody's opinion of them. And uh, uh, roundly, like all of them, uh, the stewardesses say that Comp A is a good likeness. And that that happened. I mean, that was a day after the hijacking. I think or two days max. So that what I'm what I'm getting at is I feel like that uh, suggests to me that Comp A probably is our best uh, likeness. I think probably more likely than Comp B. Um, now, now I will say this: Comp B was very. They all said the same thing, or most of them said this is a great likeness. But again, they had a uh, memory decay. It was it was later on after the skyjacking that uh, they put that one together. So I don't know. If, and another thing too about Comp A, I don't hear this mentioned ever, but to me, it looks it has Native American features. I think you know some of those kind of soft, more feminine features. I feel like just subjectively, I think I see I, I see that in some Native American men. That's interesting. I don't know if I've ever thought about that, but I can see that. Yeah, I mean, it definitely looks very feminine, that, that first sketch. And then, uh, you know, we kind of hit on this earlier, but that the guy that hoaxed the magazine and then also, you know, Comp B is made from a, uh, the template, the base of it is a mugshot that somebody picked out that said, this guy, this has a guy got a decent likeness and it's called KK51. You guys can see that on Norjack.org as well. But the thing that really pokes sticks out about that is that he also has that old guy lip, that really pouty, puffy, I mean, not puffy, but jutting lower lip. Uh, and I kind of think I, in, my, in my brain, I kind of wonder if that's kind of what, you know, drew them to that that uh, that shot. And that's kind of, you know, though, the, it basically can't be was crafted wholly from that lip, essentially. Yeah, that's true, because if I'm thinking I remember a guy with a big nose and then I'm looking through pictures and then, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that nose matches, but the rest of the face doesn't, I probably would be like, well, yeah, this the, the nose is just like this. Yeah. And so they choose that portion of the face. Yeah. And I want to this is another pet peeve of mine. I want to issue a petition for everybody in the vortex is under 40 that we quit calling them uh, the Bing and Cary Grant sketch because. I don't know who the hell those two people are, and I always have to think. <laughs> every time somebody said, "Now I'm," I mean, now it's iron into me. But for years, I thought, "Bing, which one's Bing? Which one's Bing?" They're comp A and comp B here for. That's my that's my vote. You don't know Cary Grant? I do not. I I couldn't tell you even now. I couldn't tell you what he's done. I know that I'm sure he was a superstar, but uh, I don't don't know Cary Grant nor uh Bing Crosby. Is it Bing or Ben? Bing, B I N G. Yeah, I don't don't know either of those. And I consider myself something of a movie guy. Cary Grant, I can always picture, but Bing Crosby, that is one that I'm probably more familiar with from Cooper than I am from his work. Yeah, the the pictures I've seen of that one, that seems like it's way old timey, like almost silent film era. <laughs> silent film era. I want to say Bing Crosby is like the fifties, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Drew, why is this case still unsolved? You know, I think it's just the, the, the I think he I think he caught him at the right time. Again, like kind of going back to what I said at the top of the show is that uh you know, it's it's just recent enough that it feels like it's in our universe, I guess you'd say. Uh but it was before they had all these things ironed out, you know, no Cooper Vane. Obviously, he was the first one to produce the pressure bump, which that's that was the big catcher for everybody else. I think there's a no huge cameras advantage. at PDX. Right, exactly. Yes, yeah. Uh, you know, it was just a different time. I think he did it at the, almost the optimal time. I mean, obviously, you could do it a couple of years later and get away with it, but there was problems there too. One of the things Eric tried to do, Eric Ulis, that I thought was such a great idea, but I, I, I thought it was a great idea, but in my head, I was still like, this won't work, even though mm -hmm. I want it to, was when he was like, hey, do you know anyone that happened to be at the airport that took a picture that day? Because that would have been like... We all have iPhones now and take pictures of everything. Right. I took a picture of my food. I took a picture of a broken part on the vacuum. I took a picture of my notes. So I had them. pictures of everything. But in 71, it would be like, you know, my dad and my brother, they're going to fly to Cincinnati and take this trip. And so we're going to take a picture of them at the airport. Mm. And and Eric had that campaign like, hey, you know, are there any pictures being taken there? And I think that is a good idea. I just don't think it it's going to bear any fruit. But do you think right. there is a chance that 
there was a picture somewhere of Cooper staring. And it even could have been like him staring out the window. Because I believe, you know, someone said that that they saw him and he was just staring out the window. Which, you know, I've done in an airport, stood by the window and stared out and looked at the planes. They have those windows for that. Oh, yeah. You're talking about stare out the window pre-flight. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Pre-flight I think at the airport. I think I've heard that, too. They said that they're all huddled up talking about the storm and he's off by himself staring. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that's super low probability, but this does kind of bring up something, uh, you know, and I kind of mentioned this with the tie, like the people that say, oh, my gosh, there's so many problems with the tie. It could be from cigarettes. The the uh, electron microscope picked up different stuff. It's calcium. It's not antimony. You know, even though you got, like I said, an array of particles, you can say, well, that he could have gotten it from jet exhaust or I think I saw somebody mention that it flaked off the uh, supersonic uh, planes and it just fell down to their tie. <laughs> uh, this kind of goes with this. This hits Eric a lot. I think. What else? I just want to anybody that says those things. I want to say this to you. What else are you going to do? It's that the, the, he's. I think Eric finds things, tries to. I look for things that are actionable and just goes after them, no matter how absurd they are. That's because well said. It, it's either you're going to do that, or you're going to sit in the uh, chat room and talk about uh, what it means to uh, order seven and seven up. Uh, you know, bourbon and seven up again for the fifty millionth time. Yeah, that is well said. Even how, and I, like I said, I don't think that's a ridiculous idea. I think it's a good idea. I just think the, the odds of that and that you knowing that that picture was taken on that day and that this person in the background, the odds yeah. of that coming forward, and especially that you're listening to one of these weird, obscure DB Cooper shows. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a Hail Mary, but I mean, if you're down, but it is actionable. You got, you got like two you seconds said. left. I don't, what a, you know, you're going to throw the ball up. Yeah. I really appreciate how much attention Eric is bringing to this case. Yeah. I appreciate new, fresh ideas. I appreciate the motivation. I, I appreciate the Facebook group because I think that's brought a lot of people. Oh, certainly. Yeah, I wouldn't be talking case. to you now if it, if it wasn't for the Facebook group, I don't think. But, you know, just based on talking to you, it doesn't sound like you think Vince Peterson or, or Milton Bordal, for that matter, is a good suspect. Uh, good suspect is a, what does that mean in the vortex nowadays? I mean, I think guys like us that have spent so much time in it, it's sort of like, uh, we know that there's not a good suspect. I mean, it's less, uh, what it quote, quote unquote be a good suspect. I would say that they got less than a 5% chance to be the guy, uh, you know, of the ones that we've identified. So no, I don't think they're, I don't think that they're Cooper by for sure. I mean, uh, but I don't think anybody we've found is Cooper yet. And another thing too, about I me, mean, Vince Peterson's a, they sh- those two shouldn't be bucketed together. I'll say that. I mean, well, they're they're they're, they're forever connected together from the Rem Crew link. N- yeah, and now I tried to say why I think the Rem Crew thing might be a little bit overstated. I mean, it's again, it's all we got. So, but it, it, it it's it's on shaky ground because of that t- potential uh, antimony to calcium misidentification and the contamination with the nickel. And like I said, there could be other stuff that just wasn't documented. Oh, uh, and another thing too, I didn't say this, but about the Rim Crew was Rim Crew invented an alloy. I got the name of it here. Let me see what it is. It was uh B one twenty VCA, and this was a power horse. I mean, it was a big money maker. I built, as I understand it anyway for Rim Crew. And um, the thing about it, the reason I'm bringing this up is because it, it contains high percentages of uh. Vanadium. Vanadium, from what I can tell, when it's blended with titanium, a lot of times it's done so f- because it's, you know, it's lightweight but still durable. So they were putting it in, in aircrafts and, uh, s- you know, spacecrafts and stuff like that. And almost to a point, almost every Milton Vordal patent, including the one that they, they get the, that they reference in the tire that has the three particles on it, that he tests that B120 VCA for, you know, Oh, this new strengthening process or this new strengthening process. He tests that one. And the tie has very, very, very extremely small amounts of vanadium on it. And I, that's one thing I always thought that um, kind of per- perhaps pointed away from uh, rim crew and just, you know, uh, aerospace um, manufacturing in general. But again, I'll, anytime we bring up the tie particle stuff, I want to disclaim over and over again. I'm not a scientist, not an expert or anything. That's just something that I found. And I think, I, I believe Nikki has mentioned this concern to uh, his metallurgist, and he said the same thing that he was always kind of puzzled by the lack of vanadium, and he thought that maybe it's, it points away from aerospace as well. Now, Rim Crew did a lot of other stuff, and Milton Vordal did a lot of other stuff too that was not uh, aerospace specific. So I think he's still on the same table. But to go back to Vincent Peterson being married to Milton Vordal in the suspect category, 
I think that uh, I mean there's just two different animals. Sure, they were they were in the same place, but uh, you know, Vordal obviously fits a lot better the physical description given. Just I mean, your Cooper profile. I think everybody agrees he's a little bit of an oddball. He definitely is a Boy Scout leader type. Like uh, it seems Vincent Peterson was now. You and I don't know these people, but you know from luckily Milton Vordal has a lot of interesting uh, op eds. Uh, you know, and you can find on newspapers dot com and. You can kind of get a. Well, we uh, also you know, have an op-ed from Vince Peterson. Part one, yes, but it's a lot. It's a small sample size, so. Uh, it's yes, a small I, sample size, but. But he definitely seems does not seem like the uh, uh, uh you know, somebody who's going to hijack an airplane from that op-ed. No, I believe kids should wear life jackets. No, right, I but, don't think that guy is committing a, a, an insane crime. Right, but the guy that's talking about uh, eugenics uh, in the newspaper, I think he might. Uh, yeah, I can always believe he's not taking an airplane, I think. Right, and he's talking about abortion, like which pair of worn-out jeans I should throw away. Right, yes, exactly, yeah. It, he's I a very, very interesting character, and and I agree, like you said, th th they are married, but one of them is a lot more interesting Yeah, in, in the Cooper world than the other. And, yeah, and the other thing, too, I, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know how wealthy these guys were, but they were, um... At that at money wasn't I don't I'd be surprised if money was a motivation even if they were recently fired because they're extremely qualified I mean they would have probably got a job very quickly I don't I don't I have a hard time believing that those guys were uh, hard hard for two hundred thousand dollars to the point of uh, committing crime No they both they both were pretty successful dudes Yeah and, and motive is one thing with with certain suspects like what's what's the motive mm -hmm. Why would you do this yeah, and the thing I always bridge my mind is, uh, like I said, I feel because of the Tina Bar and the um, probably you know, like Mart, like I said again, all the caveats why I think he survived Martin Andrade's research, Tina Bar money. You know, I think that uh, you know, a probability for a water landing, etc. Uh, it's weird that he obviously landed and kept the money, or at least that's what I think happened, but he didn't spend it. So then you think, what was the motive? And it was either he, like I said, he knew it was going to be serialized. He was waiting for that to come out, or he did it for some kind of higher, you know, ideological purpose that we don't understand. Do you think there's any sort of FBI or CIA cover up or association with this crime? I, I, I don't know. I think very, very unlikely. I mean, basically, that's kind of like the aliens thing. You just say everything's the CIA that you can't explain is the CIA. I mean, sure, it could be because uh, you can't, you can't, uh, Prove or disprove it, but I see you're you know you're you're um, basically assuming there's a lot of secrets, a network of secrets that we'll never know about, which is always scary to just explain it away that way. What do you think it would take to solve this case? DNA, obviously, which is this is another thing too. I wanted to ask you about this DNA. You know, they they, they the FBI has this. They say um, we have a profile. I think they describe it as a partial profile. No, everybody uses that term, but I don't know if the FBI says that. And they, uh, we can test, we can rule somebody out, but we can't rule them in. That does not make sense. I can't, I can't put that together in my brain. I know, except, and we have suspects that were ruled out. I'm using air quotes. That's no one what can I see, but we, they're yeah. ruled out based on a DNA profile that we know nothing about. That right. they're not. They said they're not confident in, mm -hmm. and we have no idea any of its validity if it's seven or eight different profiles combined that are sketchy if it's one or two profiles that are incomplete we really don't know the answer to that yeah and, and that's what i was getting at do we know how many of them have been tested for dna i know sheridan peterson and mccoy I, i'm not super confident i want to say it's like four-ish i i believe wolfgang gossett had really? his dna compared oh wow uh, I did not to know it that. and w was ruled out Dwayne weber McCoy was one of them. Right. Okay. And then, I can't remember the other. I, I, I think Sheridan Peterson got it done, right? Sheridan Peterson. Yes. Yes. You're right. But for some of those cameras were pressing, right? I mean, what I'm getting at is these could have, it may not even be true. They could just be sick and tired of being called by somebody saying, Hey, I'm producing something and I think this is the guy. Can we do anything about it? And they think, okay, I'm going to just DNA test this person, you know, fake, you know, fake DNA test them. And that way they'll shut the hell up. Kind of like they did with uh Rackstraw, you know, they said, I I'm tired of hearing if you were close in the case, basically. Yeah. But I don't know that uh, the only, the only explanation I can think of, they actually had a one that can rule somebody in, but not out. It's because they have all those profiles. You know, I think they said possibly up to 13 profiles or whatever on the tie. 
and um, you know they're they they're just splattering it up against all thirteen. They assume they know that one's Cooper's, and if you don't hit it, then that's how they're ruling you in, but not out. I guess I don't know. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But that's that, as far as what it's going to take to solve the case. I think it's got DNA. It's about the only thing. I think that uh, Tessa and uh, Pat Boland had a idea where I hope I'm not misinterpreting that or misstating this, but they were going to try to DNA test the the uh, tire or whatever partial probe they have, and then DNA test the parachute, uh, you know, the one that's in the museum, and try to see if there's a signature that matches the two, then that must be the profile, which is a great idea. I think that, that that's a, if that, if that is what they were doing, or if that is possible, that's what needs to happen, I think. And then the other way is, like I said, we find some more information, like I said, maybe we, uh, somehow we narrow the, the, the funnel enough, and we find somebody that's a family member, and they uh, discover evidence that was left behind. I think those are the only two ways. Yeah, and if we want to solve this case, why don't we test that other parachute for every DNA profile we can at this point? Yeah. Well, sure, I don't know. it's been handled by hundreds of people, people that worked at the museum, but, you know, Drew, if you handled it in 1993 at the museum, I'm confident we could rule you out as not being well, Cooper, we... but then there's these other DNA profiles we could look at. It. I just wish that there was some action <laughs> going Absolutely. on outside of the Cooper vortex. Like we're, we're seriously trying to fund getting some forensic work done on this tie. It's a crazy case that the only evidence we have, we're really crowdfunding that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. That work ourselves. Yeah. No, I have to assume the DNA is insanely financially prohibitive. I, I have to assume to actually do it right. Or otherwise I would think it would be done by now. I don't know. I, I tend to agree with you there. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. At this point in time, we already discussed that there have been several confessions in this case. Mm. If Tara comes out tomorrow with a story that her grandfather told her, could it be good enough that we believe it? Without evidence? I don't know. I don't I don't think so. I don't know. She's got it, no evidence, but a if, really good story. If Tara is not in the vortex and her grandpa or uncle or whoever is a metallurgist and swarthy and uh, was spent time in uh, Quebec or Belgium, uh, maybe we could think about it, but I don't know. Be compelling to say for sure. We're never going to know, like I said, unless we find evidence or DNA, I don't think. I'm very gullible and I'm a fool, mm. but... I'm up in the air about whether or not I could hear a story that would be good enough that I'm sold Yeah. at this point in time, because I've heard so many. I've read all these books where I finished the book, I put it down, and I'm like, well, it was Kenny Christensen. Well, obviously, it was E. Howard Hunt. Well, obviously, it was uh, Lauren Hall. Yeah. Every time I put one of those books down, I'm like, okay, you sold me. I got it. Oh, so, I got you. That's why you're so into Lauren Hall right now. It's the last one you read. Yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Which he is absolutely really good, but he is I'm he definitely is. more into Lauren Hall right now than anyone else because it's the most recent thing that I read. If you're going to produce a book tomorrow about Tommy Wiseau, uh, then maybe I'll be screaming about Tommy Wiseau being Cooper. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's I, I, he's definitely Lauren Hall is definitely an S tier suspect for sure, or person of interest. I'm sorry, I want to use the it's even our our. Uh, investigations are getting pc now but the uh <laughs> the uh he the obviously the tie thing is a big thing i know that john has suggested maybe some kind of i didn't uh, some there's some sort of link to possibly the supersonic planes that he thinks could explain those but i like i we talked about before yeah, he worked at boeing and like is it northrop gunman or whatever yeah something like that like i said i haven't read the book so i can't talk too much about it but yeah i don't know it just seems like there's this it, the description does not the the physical description is close. Don't get me wrong. He's got he's definitely like you said at the top of the show that he's very um. There's been a reluctance or a lack of Latin appearance people. Well, that guy's got it. He's very swarthy. He looks Latin. He fits the the, the eyewitness testimony pretty well. Yeah, he went by L Lorenzo Pasia for a while, and no one was right. like, "That's not a Lorenzo." Yeah, yeah, but but I, the thing I that I always go back into in my mind, and this kind of made Ted Braden kind of not likely to me is. They asked Bill Mitchell afterwards, could, do you think you could take him in a fight? Which to me is just a crazy thing to have asked, but they did. And he said yes. Or he might even said, like, you know, more emphatically than that. And I don't know. Those guys, I don't think... Uh, Cooper wasn't a badass, I don't think. Uh, and I sort of think that's what those two, the category those two guys fit under. Yeah, but if you saw Ted Braden in a suit, does Ted Braden look like a badass? 
I say I, no. I mean, you know, just the, his demeanor. We don't know because we don't know the guy. We haven't seen him walk around and move. But yeah, I don't know. You could be right. But Ted Braden's a separate problem. He's a short. He's so short. Uh, I don't think it could be. Te and Ted Braden has no explanation for the particles. He doesn't. Do you think the tie could have been purchased secondhand? Yes, that's something I wanted to talk about. Let me pull this up really quick, if you don't mind. So just recently, uh, Chris Brower has been looking really hard into the particles on the tie that are, are suggestive of smoking. And he couldn't find a lot of, uh, he kind of came to the conclusion recently that maybe he didn't smoke with the tie on, which, you know, goes against everything we, we've been saying. He's definitely a smoker. And the way that Chris Brower did it was um, he was looking at, uh, he looked at basically the composition of matches. And it seemed like they should probably have either one of potassium and chloride, chlorine together, or phosphorus and sulfur, or antimony and sulfur. And he just, he didn't find a lot of a uh, high density of those. So, oh, I mean, you know, I hate to say it, but that kind of makes the tie, suggests the tie either, number one, we are confused about that. And we need more information about what smoking particles look like and how well they're retained. Uh, number two, he worked in an environment uh, that uh, in which he couldn't smoke. And he didn't wear the tie out of the environment. Or uh, number three, it wasn't his tie. I mean, that's the, those are really the three solutions to me uh, to explain that. Now, I will say one thing I did. Tom K recently um, he put on Facebook that he lit some of those white headed matches that contained the the titanium, and he um, said that they weren't zero percent oxygen, but they were low oxygen, and they contained trace amounts of titanium, and they contained pr predominantly potassium. Now, I, I went to my, my Excel uh, table that I've put together, uh, and I tried to apply those filters, and there there was a lot of those particles, but they were low-weight potassium and chlorine, chlorine, so I don't know if that, uh, I don't know if that says anything about whether he was striking matches or not, but there are also, um, Macron flags some particles as, like, an identified um, thing, like, they have, like, a, a category for stainless steel. Like, every particle that has the composition of stainless steel, they just tell you in the Excel table that it's stainless steel. They have 74 particles that they flagged as, quote-unquote, unidentified flint that um, I think could be from a striking a lighter, perhaps. That's the thing. I mean, it's I, I would have said before, I thought for sure that it was his time because of the fact that I feel like the witness description of him as a geeky old guy and a, a quote-unquote, executive type, while also not perhaps being independent wealthy and not having to hijack an airplane... I think that fits a re research uh, guy pretty well, you know, and he's meek and mild. You know, back then, I think a lot of the times the businessmen were very boisterous and charismatic and doesn't seem like that's how this guy was. So that's kind of why. I th and then the other thing was it had that tie clip w on it. And I don't know. I mean, I guess it's possible, but it seems weird to me that he would go to the thrift store or whatever and pick up the tie and then add a tie clip to it. But I mean, I guess he could have. Uh, or, I mean, it was a clip on tie. He didn't have to add the clip to it. Yeah. Oh, you mean yeah. the, 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 the tie pen? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The alligator alligator tie clip. The mother of pearl one. Now, okay, there's something about that. Uh, Eric Euless, probably rightly so, has said this tie was his, even without the smoking particles, because it has gold on it. Now, the problem with that, I've I've looked into this some, too. And if you look at the gold, uh, one thing I've added to the Mercron is I, I've... I've uh, I've grouped these the stubs by location so I can see like the front, you know, what particles are hitting on the front of the tie versus the knot versus the back of the tie. And um, there is a blurb, a huge blurb of gold. It's on stub 644, which is on um, the front, and stub 666, which is on the back. It's like, for example, there's uh, gold particles on the tie. There's 6,000 of them. And uh, almost uh, uh, over 5,000 of them are just on those two stubs out of I think it's 19 stubs. So there's a high concentration of gold particles in one spot. Now, I don't know where exactly those were. Like, you know, I don't know if those were in the middle of the tie or, or, you know, further up or whatever, but they were on the front. One stub's on the front, one stub's on the back, which that that makes it sound like that could have flaked off from the, the alligator tie clip. You know, it's just catching that one spot, the spot on the front and the spot on the back. Now, the problem, I don't know if there's any validity to it, but apparently somebody on the drop zone, Nikki was sharing this with me, has uh, looked for those tie clips, and somehow he determined that it had to be, or most likely it was an 18, 18 karat tie clip, which I don't know. I don't know if that's right or wrong. I can't attest to that. And it, but if it was that, it would should have these these um these two blurbs of gold are very very low weight gold. It's like less than four percent gold. Uh, if it was that eighteen karat, it should be well over seventy percent gold. So 
that take take with that what you will, but that's kind of I was trying to kind of uh, verify whether or not the tie clip suggests it's been there a long time. And uh, you know, I, I think everybody would agree it's very unlikely that the thrift store would sell the tie with the tie clip. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but I don't know. I think I I'd, I would say that if we find that this guy did not smoke, you know, with the tie on, then it, it's it flips things a lot more likely that he picked it up secondhand. Well, if the tie's secondhand, then does it matter? It does not figuring matter, no. out where the tie came from. Doesn't matter. That's and that's the whole. Well, I, it could. I'll say this: if the antimony three antimony particles, if we somehow ever figure out that's for sure true, uh, and not a misidentification of calcium, then it could matter because that's very rare. And it could say, okay, he got this from a thrift store in Spokane or wherever, you know, wherever we can track the tie to. But that'd be about all it would do. But yeah, that's the. Um, no, nah, it does not matter. But I'm gonna keep. I've said this several times. It's there's not much else you can do that's more actionable than this. I don't feel anyway. It doesn't seem to be much action we can take on the Tina Bar money at this point in time. Right? Yeah. No, not now. There's nothing left to do. But I think it's spoken for itself fully. Like I said, it's all signs point to it was buried there by a human. For and now the reason we can speculate on. But I think, like I said, I think that tells us something important. I think that tells us that he probably survived and probably kept the money when he landed. Will this case ever be solved? Uh, I don't know. Like I said, when I realized I was in the vortex, it's because my wife told me, asked me, are they ever going to solve it? And I realized that probably the answer is no. Uh, I don't know. I hate to be a Debbie Downer, but I think I got to say no. It's just too obscure. The DNA's too murky. There's not a good way to get get to it. Uh, I don't know. A DNA or finding evidence is the only way to find it, to, to shut the book and... Those two look like they're very, very low prospect at this point in time. The further we get away from it. Well, I'm sorry, there's an the inverse relationship. The further we get away from it, the evidence goes away, but maybe we get more technological advances to the DNA. I mean, if we're we're going on fifty three new years now, it's tough to find new evidence. Right, yeah, exactly. Well, I mean something stashed away, you know, somebody the uh Cooper kept a keepsake or whatever and his grandkids found it in the attic and they're gonna come out and show the world and sell a documentary to Netflix. That'd be where the evidence would come from. What happens when this case gets solved? You know, that's uh, crazy to me that people still think we're going to obsess over D.B. Cooper once it's solved. I think uh, I'll probably read whatever book or watch whatever documentary, and that'll probably be the last time I ever think about D.B. Cooper again. <laughs> and probably talk to any of you guys, I'm sure. <laughs> you no, don't I think can't. the D.B. Cooper Fantasy Football League will keep I was on? That's what I was going to say. I, I will. I do. I really enjoy the Cooper and non-Cooper talks we have in the Fantasy Football group. Uh, you know, it was funny. You asked uh, John Limbach. Am I saying that right? Limbach? Yeah. You asked John Limbach, where does the highest discussion uh, for Cooper take place? And I thought, oh, it's our fantasy football group chat. <laughs> the, that's the number one thing. I think Chris Cunningham, I don't, whether by accident or design, I think he assembled some of the best. Not, not, I'm not at one of these, but I think he assembled a, a, a grouping of some of the best minds on Cooper. You know, and we got Chris Ryan. would be a good guy to curate that. Yes, absolutely. I, I tend to think maybe the longer we go, I think, well, he did this on purpose, but I think it's a coincidence. I'll give I try not that. to say anything good about Chris Cunningham, yeah. but he did a good job curating that football group. It is. Yeah, it's a good. I, I feel bad. I, sometimes there's a couple of us that blow it up and I feel bad for the people that are less active, but I just cherish it too much. I'm going to take advantage of it as much as I can. Anytime I think of something about Cooper, I'm going to hit it there first. Which to, I know, I, I, when we got to this tie talk and Barb Dayton and all that, I thought to myself, "This has got to be the dorkiest fancy football league of all time." <laughs> but it's I, I love it to death. It has got to be the dorkiest fantasy football group of all time. Okay, speaking of Barb Dayton, you had yeah. to know this was coming. Yeah. What do you yeah. think of the Barb is Clara news? And have you read Max Gunther? Let's start there. Have I you have. read that? Yeah, and I yeah, that's okay. So, like I said, I got into this through your podcast. So that's 2018. That's pretty late in the game for Max Gunther. I was way deep in this. Was I read Max Gunther in the past year? It was, you know, I got deep into it, and I thought that's it's a love story. It's clearly the the stuff I know about it. There's no credit to it at all. So I'm never going to read it. Well, you know, obviously I exhausted all my Cooper interests uh, doing the stuff that I thought did matter. So I thought I was going to read through it. And as I read through that book from, I, I think this is, it's probably because of the fact I read it after I knew so much. I was really surprised that the, the there's some stuff in there that's spookily spooky. It is spooky. Uh, that's a great word to describe it. Spooky. Like uh, he's the, he, French, okay, Max Gunther or the hoaxer could not have known that French Canada was relevant. He mentioned, for, you know, with the Dan Cooper comic. 
he mentions the uh did we talk about the dan cooper comic uh a, a little bit we briefly okay. touched on the homage thing yeah. yeah so he he the um he's french canadian he sends him to belgium this the max gunther or whoever the hoaxer is if you want to say that he sends him to belgium for the war he's uh a industrial chemical salesman. Industrial chemicals. Now the the I cannot tell you. And also, he's from Hart. He is in New Jersey and Hartford, Connecticut, explicitly. Out of the, you asked me how many metallurgists I've looked into. They are by far disproportionately in in uh, Connecticut, by far. And I just env- envision a scenario where this guy um, isn't a metallurgist, but he's going to these places where somebody's been hunched over a bench, you know, working on an alloy or whatever all day. And then he goes in there, shakes his hand, gets in the car, takes the tie off, you know, basically gets the particles on his hand, grabs the tie, takes it off, lights up a cigarette, you know, I, that, that, I don't think that Dane LeClaire is a uh, DB Cooper, but he's uh he should be considered a lot more likely than he is. I know a lot of the real true experts think it's just completely out there. No chance. Um, and then the There's other thing too, many too coincidences. is that Elsa, he's, he gives you an Elsinore ghost potential connection. <laughs> and it, it, again, whoever the, these, um, whoever crafted the book, whether you want to say Max Gunther faked it or Barb Dayton faked it or somebody else faked it, they, those are a blo- those, all those things, they would not know that they would be relevant today. So I don't know. That's that to me, that's always been spooky. And that's why my first belief was that, um, that with the style Stylometry, right? Is that, or I say, is it stylometry? You know, your guess is good. Okay, we're gonna say Sty- style stylometry. I would say stylometry. So Let's go with, with that. The, That's with a that, cool way to say it. I, I th- this hit me right in the this came hit like right in the peak of tax season. I think it was like late March, I believe, or maybe mid March. So I hadn't really looked at it that hard, but my first thought was. um you know, this is a science that's used to test like novels against one another. They have super large sample sizes, and I don't know. I just feel like a. I think it's it's a two hundred fifty page letter. Maybe once three hundred. I mean, two hundred fifty words. words. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I I feel like there could potentially be a lot of noise in that, and it could have just been a coincidence that it matched. And the reason, another reason too, is that in the the uh, DB Cooper, what really happened? Max Gunther is is contacted by uh, Dan Leclaire in April of nineteen seventy two. So basically, if it, if it's Barb Dayton, you're saying that she got super obsessed with DB Cooper, you know, just a couple months after the hijacking, and decided to fake being DB Cooper to multiple people, and set up a fake meeting in New York City. And Barb Dayton's not in New York City. All the letters are postmarked in New York. It's she necess- unnecessarily makes up this fake New York thing for. I mean, there's nothing to gain for if she's faking it. I it think just, that's the best evidence against Barb being Clara. Yeah. is the New York postmark. Yeah, I, and the, I really struggle with that. Right, right. And, and the timing, I think, is too quick, too. Like I said, that uh, he, uh, you know, sh- I, that Barb Dayton um, decided to fake the hoaxes guy in th- a couple months after the hijacking and then didn't do anything with it and came back uh, eight years later or ten years later and decided to pick it back up. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like I said, the New York postmark, I struggle with that a lot. But at the same time, if if I use stylometry to compare your aunt's letter to you mm-hmm. against the Max Gunther one, and it was a hundred percent match, I would say, oh, that's obviously a complete coincidence. It's that's ridiculous, blah yeah. blah blah. But we're talking about someone who was already a DB Cooper suspect, somebody who obviously had some identity issues. We're talking about someone who potentially could have done the db cooper hijacking and or somebody who would have associated themselves with that who then would have that wanted that story to change from being a man to a woman's point of view on that story yeah there are just so many things where it, it makes so much sense and it fills so much in and i also huge bias here but i i love the barb dayton thing and I, I want Barb Dayton to be Clara. So I am I am biased in that. I love Barb, but there are just so many coincidences. If we could have matched the Clara letter to writings from Joe Weber, that's another one that I would have been super, super interested in. Yeah. Because obviously there's a link there. But yeah, if it's sick. if it's your aunt or it's my wife's friend, then I'm I'm not interested in that at all. But this is already someone we were talking about. This is mm-hmm. already someone that was in the vortex. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. That's the most compelling thing for it to, to, to for the other the other argument. But I don't know. I just have a hard time believing Barb Dayton got that obsessed that quickly to contact him in seventy two. And uh, I will say this as well. Max Gunther uh, says that uh, you know it's like a type all like uh, there's responses from multiple. It's the second letter that Dan Leclaire sends him is suggests that he asked multiple people to put out that ad, the Happy Birthday, Clara. I went into newspapers.com uh, when I was reading it, and I found several. I think it's 10 or 12 uh, Happy Birthday Claras across the country uh, around that same time period. Now, those could be coincidence or whatever, but I read yeah, there you were know, chicks named Clara. Right, yeah. But some of them were Happy Birthday Clara, comma, whatever the author's name was, the same as Max Gunther's. But that's for, like I said, that could be coincidence. I'll just say that to, I've heard it suggested that, oh, well, Max Gunther just made, you know, Barb Dayton reached out to uh, Max Gunther. Uh, in 82 or whenever it was. And then he just made up the Daniel Clear outreach retroactively. But I think Dave, I want to say Dave Feudman may even have a copy of the magazine in which Max Gunther's uh, uh, Happy Birthday ad is put out. That would not surprise me. So I, what I'm getting at is, I don't know. I mean, do you think, do, do you think Barb Dayton was obsessed with Cooper in 72? En enough to, to hoax an author? Well, I think you should ask me if I think D.B. Cooper was Barb Dayton. Oh yeah, I, I, so I was, I, everybody seems they know the answer to that one. What do you think? I I love Barb Dayton. I'm not betting the farm on Barb Dayton being Cooper. Right. Yeah, I think it's low. One of the worst, sus, one of the lower probability suspects, in my opinion. But Barb Dayton being Cooper is the most Portland. It's the most Seattle story of all mm. time. It's the greatest ending to this. It's fantastic. Uh, if I, I've always said if I could pick who D.B. Cooper was, right, I would pick Barb Dayton. Yeah, I will say this: if uh, if you did solve it and it was Barb Dayton, you'd probably make a lot more money than any of the other suspects. Yeah, that's I agree. A very, and that's a very sellable, sellable movie or book or whatever. I, I've said it before. When I first picked up the Foreman's book, I thought it was a woke Seattle couple trying to pitch th this weird book about cooper being a trans person mm -hmm. and i read the book and i was like okay i don't really get that vibe but maybe it's still possible but it, the second i met the foremans i was like okay i was wildly off i was yeah. wildly yeah off. no I, I don't get they seem when i listened to your podcast i was very surprised at how genuine uh the foremans and uh wolfgang gossett's son uh were both of them just their attitudes was very convincing to me that they at least they really believed this stuff yeah, and I've told the story before, but uh, Greg Gossett, I I drove there and did that interview in person, and he told me he wanted to have dinner with me before doing the podcast, which normally I'd be totally against because I want to have this conversation fresh. I want to hear your ideas. I don't want to rehash something fake on the show. So, I mean, you, Drew, you can attest to that. We 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 spoke for a total of seven minutes before we did this podcast. Mm -hmm. And, but what I got from that having dinner with Greg was that he didn't want me to twist his words. He was very cautious of me having an agenda. And just once he realized yeah. that I just wanted to hear what he had to say, he was completely comfortable. Yeah. And it seemingly wasn't trying to profiteer off of it in any way either. No, not in any way. Mm -hmm. And really, his whole attitude was if my dad's not Cooper, and you can rule him out conclusively, fantastic, let me know. And if he is Cooper, and you can prove that he was, okay, let me know, that's fantastic. And he'll just move on either way. But it's just another thing his dad told him, and he was very clear to me that he doesn't idolize his father. Uh, he was very quick to say he wasn't a great dad. So he's not, he's not on a campaign. He's not pushing a book he wrote about his father. It just happens to be something that happened in his life. Yeah. And, and he seemed, like I said, about it. he seemed he really believed it and didn't, I don't think he had anything to gain for lying about it. So I don't know. That's uh, he could just, it's kind of like the um, tragedy t with uh, um, Joanne Weber. Same thing. She just, he got told something and he believed it. Now he didn't become obsessed like she did, but. I've said it before and I've, I've heard it from a couple other people, but it, it's interesting. Like was Joe Weber the biggest victim of D.B. Cooper? <laughs> yes, it's crazy to think about that, but probably so. Yeah, I mean, uh, Atina had to run off, and didn't, did I hear somebody say she was uh, a nun for a moment afterwards? She definitely was. 
but I don't know if that was Cooper motivated or what. Uh, if it was I, not, I, I definitely don't think that was Cooper motivated at all. Mm-hmm. I've never sought out any of the stewardesses or anything like that. I want to make it very clear. I've never harassed Tina Mucklow. I've never reached out to her in any way because, you know, they didn't choose to participate in this. You mm-hmm. did, Drew. You chose to participate in the Cooper Vortex. Well, I, I, like I said, I, I didn't necessarily, but I guess so. I guess you could say it that way. <laughs> you did choose. This is a self-selecting group, and mm. this is something I've been thinking about a lot more recently. Mm. What What is it that draws people to the Vortex, and what do you think we have in common? Because it's a very different group of people, but we all have this same weird obsession. Right. Yeah. I don't know. That is a good question. And I, you know, I kind of sort of thought when you asked uh, somebody else that recently, I thought, is that really right? See, because I, I just in my mind, uh, it seems like the Facebook group is primarily like uh, white collar employees that say like doctors, lawyers, accountants, et cetera, professional types. But when I started, after you said that, I kind of flipped through some of the people and I thought, well, that's not, this and that's not, that's not necessarily the case. So I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Uh, that one I would I, consider I, myself blue collar. Well, and, uh, like I said, there's plenty of them like that as well in the in the vortex. Uh, I mean, in the in the on the Facebook group. Uh, I don't know. It's that is weird. It's very it's an array of people for sure. It, it's a very wide array of people, mm-hmm. and you know there are people in in the vortex who are doing very well financially. There are people in the vortex who don't have any means. Right. Um. There are professionals, like you've said. There are are you know. People who are very blue collar, the age range is pretty wild now. I mean, when I first got in the vortex, there weren't a, a lot of young people, but mm-hmm. I think there's a lot more now. But I've just thought a lot about what is it about this group of people that is drawn to this? Yeah. Because and nobody I- forced us into this. We're choosing to do this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'll say that uh, I could, I think it could just be that. It's inherently interesting, and a lot of people don't know about it. I'm always stunned that uh, when I tell people I'm into D.B. Cooper, and they say, what's D.B. Cooper? I think, man, I thought everybody knew about this. I think maybe we just were the ones that happened to find it in a, in a curious moment, and uh, we latched on. I think if it was more in the zeitgeist, maybe you know, it would seem like it's, it's obvious why everybody's obsessed with it. Not obsessed, but interested in it. Well, you and I are obsessed. That's right, yeah. Unfortunately, I think I have to admit that these days. Okay, now I got to ask you this: why, why is the true crime audience primarily uh-huh. female, but the DB Cooper audience is overwhelmingly male, over ninety percent right. male? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew this one was coming. I, I have a question for you first. Um, are you trying to get people canceled with this question? That is my goal. I was like, <laughs> you know, if only I could get Drew fired from his job. Oh, no, you don't have to worry about all that of his family to hate him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think that somebody's truly somebody's mentioned this before, but to me, true crime, this is not a true crime. This is crime, but it's not, it, it doesn't fit the true crime genre. I mean, true crime genre, when I, I think when people look like type that into their podcast search or whatever, YouTube, they're looking for something involving murder or rape or something a lot more gory and very different than a hijacking. I don't think very many people are typing in true crime and looking for, you know, a train robbery or a, or a, a you a know, DB Cooper. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I think that's the main reason. Now, I think this is so really, I think the question is, why do women like true crime? And that's what I don't think I'm equipped to answer. But yeah, that is one that. You know, whatever answer you have can start to get you into trouble with stereotyping and generalizing and blah, blah, right. blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that I'm worried about doing that. I'm not trying to cop out or anything, but I don't really know. I mean, I've noticed my wife and women in my life in general, they're more into, you know, horror movies and gore and stuff like that. It's just something that fascinates them. But I mean, there's plenty of men that view it that way as well, too. But I think that's the really the reason why it's just there's some phenomenon we can't explain that women like true crime. And to me, D.B. Cooper isn't really true crime. All right. What do you think are the best books on this case? Yeah, so I don't know. You might make fun of me, but I have only read Flight 305 by, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Bob Edwards, like we've mentioned, and uh, Max Gunther's uh, What Really Happened. So the only two books I brought up were happened to be the ones that you'd read? Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, that's what I was getting. I think they're (laughs) 
Uh, I don't want to disparage any other authors, but I think that the two most important books at this point, which is crazy to say about Max Gunther's, but how could you have not read Bruce Smith's DB Cooper in the FBI? I have not. And, uh, shame on you. Yeah. I don't know. I, I've gotten that one before, but I don't know. I just feel like that one's not one, but, and, but, uh, okay, let me say this. It seems from my, the synopsis that I've heard is that a lot of that is, uh, you know, blaming the FBI or, or naysaying the FBI. Well, and there I, are certain aspects of the book that do that, certainly. Yeah. But he also, he's got a bunch of great chapters about suspects and well, everything in the case. And now I'm furious at you that you haven't read that. Okay. Right, yeah. And you I, quoted I, Marty's book. Have you read Marty's book? I have not. No, no, I have not. Oh, I've my thought, God, I've, Drew. Yeah, it's bad, I know. But the, what I was getting at is most of them are suspect driven. and Most know, of them are, yeah. And the, the when I learned of these books, I was already kind of at a point where I felt like most of these could be ruled out anyway. So that's kind of one reason. Bruce Smith, I know, is one maybe I should have read. But uh, not only should you have read that, it should be on your bookshelf. Mm. I'm ashamed of you. <laughs> yeah, well, sorry. This episode will never air. Yeah, yeah you can, can put it in the can. <laughs> I don't have any defense for that one. All right. Speaking of questions that are going to get you in trouble, here's a curveball. Did the recent Boeing whistleblower kill himself or was he suicided? I do. I don't know. I'm not that knowledgeable of that case, that situation. I do know what you're talking about because it's been in national news and whatnot, but I certainly have not uh, heard anybody pitch very. I mean, you know, I've seen the memes and stuff about him killing, you know, being murdered, but uh, I don't know the evidence around that. Maybe you could tell me what you think. He traveled to do a deposition. A deposition, sorry. He traveled to do a deposition. And then, right before going, kills himself in the parking lot in his pickup truck. Hmm. Oh, I didn't realize it was that right. I didn't realize they were, he was in the parking lot of the courthouse. The parking lot of the hotel. Oh, okay. So, what do you, do you think this pertains to Cooper in some way with the Boeing? You're saying Boeing's history? Well, you know, we're talking about Boeing, and I just wanted to, you know, on a weird, obscure podcast that involves a lot of conspiracy theory... Right. Why not throw out a recent Boeing one? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I'm not obsessed enough with that one to know much about it or to have an opinion, I guess. Shame on you. Shame on you, Drew. I thought you were going to have a hot conspiratorial take on that. No, I'm not. I, it's, I tell you what, I think if you talk to people that know me, they think it's weird I was into D.B. Cooper because I'm not, I'm not a big conspiracy theory kind of mystery guy. I, I don't know. It's just uh, something that caught, caught my attention. Is there anyone in your personal life that will listen to you talk about D.B. Cooper? Oh, I, I'm sure some of my buddies will give it a listen when I share it to them, but uh, maybe my wife, maybe. But I think when they look down, see it's two and a half hours, they might uh, opt to skip on, skip it. Well, well, forget the podcast. In your oh in no your no personal life, is there anyone that you can talk to about this? No, and they do not. They like I said, when you start talking to them, their eyes glaze over, and you can tell they try to get out of the room as quick as they can. Can't stand it. And I, I caught that, but luckily for me, I caught that cue pretty early on and I try. I, I've had, I've had limited attempts. I'll say that. You know, I don't want to be like, I'm so awesome, but I do have this podcast that a lot of people listen to. Yeah. And in my personal life as the host of this show, there is zero interest. Right. There yeah. is zero interest in anyone I know listening to the show. There is zero interest in anyone I know talking to me about it. There is that weird, like, I'll meet someone and somebody else will be like, oh, yeah, this is Darren. He knows everything about D.B. Cooper except the one thing you want to know. And they're like, well, what's the one thing I want to know? And that's who's D.B. Cooper. He doesn't know mm -hmm. that. And right. I'm just like, yeah, fine. Yeah, I guess I know a lot about the Cooper case. Oh, yeah. And he has a podcast about it. He's been doing for seven years. Yeah, I know. I, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. Maybe I shouldn't say this on the podcast, but. Uh, I, when I met Ron in person, I, I tracked him down at Ole Miss. Uh, you know, Ron and I are both Mississippi people. And uh, I went over, shook his hand, you know, talked to him or whatever. And I was, you know, his, uh, his family and friends and stuff were around that he was tailgating with. And I mentioned that I know him from D.B. Cooper. And none of them, they did not, they had no idea that uh, he was deep into D.B. Cooper. And I thought that was crazy <laughs> that this guy who seems like this is such a key part of his life that his, you know, his close uh, knit didn't know anything about it. I just imagined that he's just constantly nonstop talking about it. That is so funny. That is, that's D.B. Cooper life. Right. Yeah. Where yeah it's, he... You're in this weird community and everyone's obsessed with it and everything's a big deal. The Barb Clara news was groundbreaking and earth shattering. 
and then you go back to your life and no one knows anything about it no one cares no one wants to hear you talk about it right and that's why we have the re the release valve now with the the group chats and the facebook group and drop zone etc so we can get all that out and not have to bother our, our family members with uh stylometry and uh titanium antimony particles <laughs> All right, Drew, is there anything I didn't ask you that uh, you wanted to talk about? Uh, I don't think so. I think we pretty well covered all of it, Darren. Uh, no, I think we got it, Darren. I I'll tell you what, I didn't I didn't think we were going to go on this long, but it was a blast. I really had a good time. You were really good about uh, you know, making it seem uh, easy to talk to you, kept the conversation moving well. And I also want to say, too, I, I don't know if I said this on air, but this is a I'm a huge fan of this podcast. I'm really, really grateful you had me on here. Probably going to get some hate mail for me being on here. I know kind of rambled a little bit. Seemed like I'm not an expert, not well read, etc. cetera. But, uh, and I, I started to tell when you asked me to do it, I started to tell you, no, I'm not fit to do it. But I just, I'm such a big fan of the podcast. I couldn't let a chance like this go by. So I feel a lot better now that we, we've got it, got it done, wrapped up. Yeah. And it's awesome. I mean, if there's, uh, if someone wants to tell you that you don't know anything about the case and all of your opinions are wrong, yeah. uh, is there somewhere we can find you? Yeah, yeah, I'm on. I'm on the 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 Facebook group on uh, you know, I think it's called DB. Let me get you the the exact DB name. Cooper Mystery Group. DB Cooper Mystery Group, yes. And uh, you know, I, I know we've talked a lot about the 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 tie particles and stuff. And um, I ha I'm willing to if anybody wants my table, I've des I've put together from the Macron data. Uh, you know, I, I Macron has it in separate sheets. Uh, and I've combined them all. And I've added filters and uh different groupings and stuff i'm happy to email my current draft to anybody if they want to look further into the tie and uh you can uh, is it best for me just to say my email out loud or you can put it in the notes or what yeah both you say it okay. out loud and i'll yeah, put yeah. it in the notes so i my email is drew daniel cpa at gmail.com and oftentimes people uh accidentally go daniels with an s but this is just drew daniel cpa at gmail.com well drew thank you so much for coming on i appreciate it and uh I'm glad I was finally able to bully you into doing this. Oh yeah, he didn't. You, it didn't take much convincing. <laughs> All right, Drew. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Yeah, me too. If you want to reach out to Drew, you can find him on the DB Cooper Mystery Group on Facebook, or you can email him directly, DrewDanielCPA at gmail.com. If you've got questions, comments, theories, or you know who DB Cooper was. Hit us up. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or email us, dbcooperpodcast at gmail.com. As always, we've got links for it all in the show notes. Thank you to Drew Daniel. I hope you enjoyed the Nuggets Lakers series as much as I did. Thank you to Russell Colbert. I hope you enjoyed the Virgin River series as much as me. Thank you to Darian Osadich for ending the show. I'm Darren Schaefer, and thank you for listening to the Cooper Vortex. Jacked a plane, so we were told Then he jumped into the cold A raspberry and a cigarette In the air, the stage is set Polite and kind, the people say It's time to make his getaway This is how the story goes About the money and the man Cooper, they call me now. Catch me if you can. Roll up in his gold bill tie. He's got enough to change his life. Where he landed, no one knows. But from his tale, a legend grows. Was a cold, dark, rainy night. As he walked, he saw light. Held his cash close to his side he Just needs to catch a ride This is how the story goes About the money and the man D.B. Cooper, they call me now Catch me if you can
broken, went down to the bone. The poor place to use the phone. Little cafe outside of town. He walked in, and he just sat down. Met a man with a cowboy hat. He told a friend right where he's at. Into the night he disappeared. And from that night a legend reared. This is how the story goes about the money and the man. TV Cooper, they call me now. Catch me if you can. Forty years the secret's out. The story has been told. TV Cooper's done running now. He was eighty. 